Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Bush. I'm a senior fellow here at the Brookings Institution and the director of our Center for East Asian Policy Studies. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you here, welcome you to uh, what is certainly my center's last program of the year and maybe one of the last at Brookings. Um, it's the first session in a two-part U.S.-Japan dialogue on perspectives on China's reemergence, and I'll explain what that means. Um, at the outset, I'd like to thank the participants uh, in today's program, uh, particularly um, our um, presenters who have traveled all the way from Japan on short notice, um, all the other participants, moderators, uh, uh, discussions and so on. Uh, I'd like to um, particularly thank my staff that has done um, a lot of hard work to put this together. Um, it will come as no surprise to anyone in this room uh, when I say that China's power and influence is rising very rapidly. We know all the facts about uh, its fast-growing economy now about to be number one in the world. Um, it's increasingly interdependent with uh, other economies in East Asia. Uh, for the last two decades, China has engaged in a sustained and sy systematic modernization of its military capabilities, and um, its power project projection is a new fact in, of life in East Asia. Um, as China's interests in East Asia and around the world grow, it's diplomatic activity and its influence uh, grow apace. Um, for me to note these trends is a stunning statement of the obvious. Um, this is today's conventional wisdom. Uh, the only thing that's startling is the speed uh, with which these trends have emerged. At the same time, uh, attitudes uh, about China around the world have grown more varied and changeable. Uh, to take only the United States and Japan, for example, American favorable views of China declined by almost a third from uh, 2011 to 2013, from 51 percent to 37 percent. In the same period, Japanese favorable views of China declined from 34 percent to 5 percent. Uh, the biggest uh, shift uh, of any country in the world uh, during that period, positive or negative. Um, the big question in all of this concerns the implications of uh, China's revival as a great power for the peace, stability, and prosperity, particularly in East Asia, but the world at large. Um, the record of the last 40 years suggests on balance that coexistence, mutual accommodation, and mutual benefit is certainly possible because that seems objectively to be um, the object the interests of all parties concerned. Uh, on the other hand, power transition theory um, suggests that such optimism is misguided, that uh, competition, conflict, and even war is possible. Some of the events of the last six years um, appear to confirm that judgment. Given the uncertainty about the future of East Asia and the haunting sense that uh, we are living in an inflection, in an inflection point, um, it's imperative that we start from a sound understanding of the drivers of these changes. Uh, among the issues uh, we might address are China's long-term goals, its grand strategy for achieving those goals, its approach to risk, uh, and the meaning of its day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month tactical moves. Um, there is a question, of course, uh, as to whether outsiders can answer these questions with accuracy and confidence. Um, as interesting as these issues are, however, um, they're not the subject of today's program. Um, we will address them in a follow-on symposium in a couple of months. Uh, today's program for, for, for excuse me, focuses more on the internal drivers of China's external behavior, specifically its economy and political system. And these are the subject of perennial fascination and curiosity. Um, China, of course, uh, has the greatest interest in answers to these questions, but um, aside from China, the two countries that probably have the greatest stake in understanding the sources, uh, trajectory, and consequences of 
China's uh, revival are Japan and the United States. Uh, Japan has the second largest economy in East Asia after China, a lively democratic system, and it's played um, an important leadership role in the region for decades. Um, the United States is the world's largest economy still. Uh, it's been the guardian of the post-war international order. Um, and um, uh, not inconsequentially, um, the United States and Japan are allies of long standing. Uh, for that latter reason alone, it would be good for our two countries to have a shared understanding about China and where it is going. Um, this certainly should be possible since Japan led the study of China by foreigners in the first half of the 20th century and the United States has arguably led uh, the study of China ever since. Um, but the reasons why gaining a shared understanding is not necessarily easy. Uh, geography alone off, uh, fosters different perspectives. Uh, China is separated from Japan by a sea and uh, from the United States by a very large ocean. Each country has its own scholarly and analytical traditions and trends. Uh, in both countries, uh, there is a range of views on the various aspects of Chinese uh, reality. So between China and Japan, uh, perhaps the most we can hope for is a shared understanding, not an identical understanding. But the purpose of today's program is to present what I think will be representative and mainstream views on China's politics and economy by um, leading scholars from both Japan and the United States. Uh, there's no pre pretense here that uh, what you will hear are the Japanese views and the American view. Um, as I said, there is a range of views in each country, but there is a value in hearing um, the views of prominent scholars from each country in order to observe the areas of overlap and, if they exist, the areas of difference. Um, we will begin with a panel on the Chinese economy, which will be chaired by Malcolm Lee, a non-resident senior fellow in the John L. Thornton China Center here at Brookings. Malcolm has a deep understanding of the Chinese economy, um, gained uh, both from government service in the Clinton and Obama administrations and in the private sector. Uh, the second panel on uh, Chinese politics uh, will be chaired by Jonathan Pollock, who has uh, studied China his entire professional career at the University of Michigan, the RAND Corporation, the Naval War College, and since 2010 uh, here at Brookings. Uh, before I turn over the chairing duties uh, to Malcolm, I would like to acknowledge my debt of gratitude uh, to Professor Akio Tanaka of the University of Tokyo. He's been my partner in this effort, and I'm uh, really deeply appreciative of his assistance and understanding. So Michael, um, the chair is yours. And uh, for the other people on the uh, panel, if you could come up and take your seats. Hi, uh, I'm Malcolm Lee. As Richard, thank you, Richard, for the, for the kind introduction. Um, as Richard said, I'll be moderating the first panel on American and Japanese perceptions of China's economic reemergence. Uh, we're all familiar with some of the facts around China's remarkable economic performance over the last three decades. I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight a few. China's economy emerged from isolation to deliver unprecedented economic growth that has lifted over 500 million of its citizens out of poverty. China is now considered by the World Bank as an upper middle income country with per capita national income now at over $6,500. In 2013, China became the world's largest tra trader in goods. The value of China's trade has doubled every four years over the last three decades. There's been a significant shift in the kinds of things that China exports from textiles and apparel to oil-based products to high-tech machinery and electronics. In 2013, China surpassed Japan as the largest holder of U.S. national debt. And in October of this year, China became the world's largest economy in purchasing power parity terms, according to the IMF. 
It has held that position with the exception of the past three centuries through most of human history. And China now comprises almost 30% of global GDP growth, significant at a time of tepid global growth. Despite these successes, China's leadership seems to understand that its investment and export growth-led model is not sustainable. President Xi has called, on, called for deep reforms at the Communist Party's third and fourth plenums with pledges to make market forces decisive, treat domestic and foreign investors equally, and reform governance and the rule of law. We have three very distinguished U.S. and Japanese scholars who will discuss U.S. and Japanese perceptions of China's reemergence as a global economic power, the nature and state of China's economic reforms, and their perceptions and the perceptions of implica and implications uh, for China's first and third largest trading partners. First, we'll hear from uh, David Dollar. David is a leading expert in China's economy and U.S.-China economic relations at the John L. Thornton Center here at Brookings. He served as Treasury's main man in China and, and previously worked at the World Bank for more than 20 years. Then we'll hear from Hank Levine, uh, a senior advisor at the Albright Stonebridge, Stonebridge Group, where he advises companies as they enter and grow in the Chinese market. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia at the Commerce Department and U.S. Consul General in Shanghai. Professor Tomu Muraka has just uh, gotten off the plane from Japan, and I'm told he's leaving tomorrow. So we uh, thank you for your, for your trip here uh, for this event. Uh, he's a professor at the Institute of Social Sciences at University of Tokyo, and has published widely on Chinese industry and economy. We're honored to welcome him here to, to Brookings. So with that, why don't we start with, with David? And then we'll then Hank and then Professor. Thank you very much, Malcolm. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I think this is a very interesting topic for a conference, you know, U.S. and Japanese perceptions about the rise of China. Uh, I'm naturally going to be speaking about my own views, uh, but I think a number of my views are pretty typical of American analysts, particularly American economists. I'll try to indicate where I think there's pretty clear uh, agreement among American economists. Uh, let me start by saying that I think American leaders and American stakeholders generally welcome the reemergence of China. We welcome the economic success of China. As the most populous country in the world, it's natural for China to be one of the biggest economies. Malcolm cited various statistics. China's tremendous growth over the past few decades has had a lot of spillover benefits. China imports a lot, different types of things from different countries. You know, this has had a lot of stimulative effect for other developing economies, for advanced economies. So I think there's a lot of economic benefit from China's success up till now. Now, having said that, I would also say that I think most American analysts feel that China's growth model, its old growth model, is running out of steam. Its old growth model depended very much on exports and also on a very high investment rate. And when the global crisis hit and that really took the wind away from China's exports, China replaced that with even more investment. Big stimulus program that took investment up to 50% of GDP. That was probably a sensible response initially to the global crisis. You know, but having maintained that for a few years, China now faces the problem that it's creating excess capacity throughout its economy. You know, when you invest 50% of GDP, you build up all different types of capacity very, very quickly. And then the issue is, is there really demand to use that? And what we're seeing right now is lots of examples where there is no demand to use the capacity that's been built up. So I'm thinking about empty apartment buildings and whole empty cities distributed around China. So excess capacity in the housing stock. Uh, tremendous excess capacity in heavy industries like steel and cement operating at about 50% of capacity. And I think excess capacity in local government infrastructure, you know, a lot of the stimulus program was aimed at building up 
highways, metros, airports, high-speed passenger rail. Certainly China needed a lot of that, but I think the evidence is China is now building you know, highways that have very minimal usage. Some of the recent sections of the high-speed passenger rail connect pretty remote parts of the country. You've got modern airports that are barely used in cities that we've never heard of. So I think there really is you know, a serious problem of excess capacity. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why the economy is slowing down, because it's natural for investment to slow down as it faces overcapacity and poor returns in so many different sectors. There are other reasons why the old growth model is running out of steam. Uh, the old growth model generated a lot of environmental degradation. So China has very serious problems of air pollution and water shortage. Dealing with those is naturally going to be expensive. And then I would also say that an important part of the old growth model was the one-child policy and its effects on demographics. By tremendously slowing down fertility and population growth, China, for a while, accelerated the growth of per capita GDP. But from here on, I'm afraid it's going to be paying the necessary price. China's labor force has already peaked and started to decline. The population is projected to peak in 2030. And the UN projects that over the rest of the century, China's population will decline by 40%. You know, it's hard to maintain rapid growth when your population and your labor force are declining at a pretty rapid rate. So I think there are a lot of reasons why the old growth model is running out of steam, and it's natural for China's growth rate to slow down. So we're not going to see growth rates of 10% any longer, not on a sustained basis. Now, having said that, I think that most analysts, and certainly David Dollar, uh, think that there are a range of structural reforms that China could carry out which to some extent would counteract the downward pressure. Only to some extent, as I said, we're not going back to 10%, but with a vigorous reform program, China can certainly sustain 6 or 7% growth for another decade. But I do think it really depends on some aggressive reforms. Now, the key reforms are outlined in the third plenum resolution. So let me just mention a few. Of course, it's, so it's, it's good that this is recognized by the Chinese leadership and that, that there are uh, on paper, plans to deal with some of these issues. Let me mention a few that I think are particularly important. One is financial reform. You know, China's had a repressed financial system that keeps interest rates low and historically has paid a poor return to households. That operates as a subsidy to investment and a tax on households. You know, so as China thinks about changing its growth model, liberalizing the financial system, raising the cost of capital will both discourage wasteful investment, also give household savers a better return. So I think that's, that's a natural reform. I'm also a big fan of HUCO reform, reforming the household registration system so more families can move from the countryside to cities. You know, as I mentioned, the labor force has already peaked, but China's urban labor force can continue to grow for at least another decade if they ease up on the HUCO restrictions, because there's still way too many people living in the countryside. So if you have a steady flow of people from the countryside to the cities, that keeps up the growth of the urban labor force, uh, enables the modern sectors to continue to grow. To the extent that people are able to bring their families, that's going to be good for consumption. You know, Anyone who moves from the countryside to the city, pretty much immediately their income goes up by about threefold. You know, people consume, even in China, people consume most of their income. They don't save most of it. <clears throat> uh, but also we account, we, we consider health and education spending to be consumption in the national accounts. We call that government consumption. So if you've got more movement to cities, including whole families, the government's going to have to spend more on health and education. That's going to be good for Chinese people, and it's going to be good for transforming the growth model uh, toward more dependence on consumption. Let me just mention one other reform, uh, which, which personally I think is quite important. Uh, you know, China has a pretty open system in terms of trade and investment concerning manufacturing, but they've made a very deliberate decision to keep most of the service sectors quite protected. So think of modern services like financial services, telecom, uh, media, logistics, 
you know, all of these are sectors dominated by big state enterprises. They're closed to foreign investment. So among the G20 countries, China is rated to be the most closed to foreign investment, you know, because those are important sectors of the economy and they're almost completely closed. Now, China in the third plenum resolution says it's going to open up those service sectors. I think that would be an important reform. It, it's linked to the transformation of the gro growth model is a little bit more subtle, but it happens that you know, investment primarily relies on industry. And once you reach middle income, consumption is primarily services. So when we talk about China reining in wasteful investment and relying more on consumption, it's almost the same thing as saying that industry will play less important role in growth and the service sectors will play a more important role. We already see this. The service sectors are growing a lot faster than industry in the last few years. But if China is going to grow based on the service sectors, it really needs to open them up and make them competitive and productive in the same way that it previously did with manufacturing. So I think there's a clear reform agenda. Uh, those reforms should raise household income and consumption. They should raise the cost of capital and rein in wasteful investment. And they should encourage more productivity, growth, and innovation so the economy can grow based more on innovation and less on capital accumulation. Now, it's good that all of that's written into the third plenum resolution, uh, but I feel that the actual progress reform is rather slow, and you can find lots of different stakeholders in the United States who also have written on this and argued that the actual progress reform is rather, progress with reform is rather slow. So we don't see very rapid movement in financial liberalization. There's some movement in HUCO reform, but the government wants to ease up HUCO restrictions in third and fourth tier cities. Not clear to me there's going to be a lot of jobs in third and fourth tier cities. The big gains would come from easing up on the restrictions in first and second tier cities. You know, we don't see that so far. I emphasize the importance of the service sectors. We don't really see much movement there. So I think there's a real struggle going on. There's obvious interest groups who oppose all these different reforms. I worry that if China doesn't reform fast enough, that there is a risk that its growth rate will slow down quite sharply uh, beyond what we've seen so far. So, uh, so I think the jury's out on whether China will successfully pursue this reform program over the next few years and really continue to grow reasonably well for a middle-income country. Or if there's not enough reform, in my view, the view of many analysts in the US, then we could see a pretty sharp slowdown in China's growth. Let me just mention briefly on the US-China relation, I think Hank Levine's going to say more. Uh, I do think China vigorously pursuing this reform agenda, not only is it good for the Chinese economy, but it would also set a better foundation for US-China economic relations, should lead to a more balanced relationship between these two biggest economies in the world. Uh, so I think that's a, a spillover benefit, not the main reason why China should do it. I think sustaining their own development is the main reason, but it would have the effect of leading to a more balanced relationship. And then the last point I want to make is that uh, I think it's noteworthy that China is trying to vigorously pursue economic reform and has certainly done so in the past, but it's not pursuing political reform. You know, the new leadership is very clear that it doesn't want to pursue political reform. And I, for one, wonder or question whether or not China can move from middle income to high income without more political liberalization, things like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the media. You know, I would point out that there are no authoritarian countries that have reached 50% of US per capita GDP. Lots of authoritarian countries have made it to middle income. There's a minor exception. There are oil-rich states that have high income and are not politically free, but they're sitting on huge piles of oil. If you put them aside, no one has really become a productive high-income economy uh, without some more free civil liberties and political liberalization. So it's always possible China will be the first, but I think when you see a strong historical pattern like that, there's likely to be a logic behind it. You can get to middle income you know, by copying and just by moving from relatively simple processes to the early stages of industrialization. But to get to high income, you really have to become a more innovative and creative economy. 
And apparently, it's hard to do that without more freedom of expression and, and freedom of ideas. So I think many American analysts, they certainly hope that there'll be political liberalization in China, which could enable China to continue to move toward high income over the next few decades. Many of us question whether if there's no political liberalization, will China really be able to pursue this economic agenda uh, and move to high income? Thank you very much. Good, thanks. And uh, first, thanks to Richard and the uh, entire team uh, here at Brookings for the invitation and the chance uh, to inflict my views uh, on you. Uh, let me say that I come to these issues really as a, as a non-economist and, and, in fact, really as a non-scholar, uh, but rather someone who spent the last 25 years or so working at that place where China's trade and investment policies intersect with the activities of U.S. companies. And, and so that's the, the kind of the background from which uh, I will offer my, uh, my comments. Uh, and, and I think reflecting to a large extent the views of, of many of the large U.S. companies <clears throat> that are involved in the China market, though I hasten to add that all of my comments are, of course, uh, only my, uh, my personal views. Uh, I also believe that, that the development of China's uh, reform and opening policies in the past have had a significant impact on U.S.-China relations. Uh, and I believe that the future uh, development uh, of the reform and opening policies will continue to have a significant impact on U.S.-China relations more broadly. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But, but if we look back at the history of reform and opening in, in China. I think we see a mixed picture from the perspective of, of U.S. companies. Uh, on the positive side, in addition to generating uh, huge uh, economic benefits for China, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, over the years, and, and particularly following China's accession to the WTO, the reform and opening policies have generated enormous opportunities revenues and profits for U.S. companies in the China market, and that applies both to the question of U.S. exports to China as well as uh, U.S. companies investing in China. In that latter category, uh, the most recent U.S.-China Business Council survey indicated that 83 percent of their members who responded uh, indicated that their operations in China are profitable. Uh, which is a, a, a pretty hefty percentage. So a lot of economic benefit. Now, I recognize that on the, the, the dramatic growth of Chinese imports into the U.S., of course, has created a, a, a mixed picture. I think it brings a lot of benefits. Uh, obviously, uh, a number of U.S. companies and some entire industries uh, have felt the pressure from those imports. Uh, and that's something we should recognize. But, but in my subsequent remarks, I will focus uh, really on uh, issues related to the operations uh, of, of the major U.S. companies that are uh, trading and investing with China. So in other words, issues in the China market, in part because they are the main focus, I would say, of the U.S. government uh, policy and because I think they have the largest impact on U.S.-China relations uh, overall. So as I mentioned, uh, we know that following China's WTO accession, uh, a great number of opportunities opened. Uh, certainly, it's fair to say the implementation of China's commitments uh, proceeded unevenly. Uh, tariff cuts were implemented uh, very smoothly. Enforcement of intellectual property rights may be somewhat less so, I guess. Um, but um, it would be a mistake, I would emphasize, to focus solely on the shortcomings of implementation or the problems that still exist. And I just reiterate that there were tremendous positive economic gains here and benefits for U.S. companies. And, and, and it's important, I think, to keep that in mind. Sometimes in this town, uh, as one listens to the rhetoric, we, we tend to forget that. Uh, but it's also true that following China's uh, accession to the WTO, as time went on, the process of reform and opening seemed to slow, maybe stop, and, and in fact, maybe go backward in, in certain respects in, in certain industries. 
Uh, I think uh, different experts have a different assessment of when to date that change, but certainly by the later years of the uh, Hu Jintao and Jia Bao administration, uh, that was obvious, I think, both to American and many Chinese observers as well. And the result was that U.S. companies and other foreign companies <clears throat> found themselves, uh, to their disappointment, uh, continuing to have to do business uh, in an environment characterized by very extensive Chinese intervention into economic and even commercial matters. And, and, and I think there had been some expectation. Uh, that following the WTO accession, the process of reform and opening would continue in a direction and at a pace uh, that would result in less uh, intervention. And of course, the intervention by the Chinese government very often uh, has taken the form of decisions or, or policies intended to benefit Chinese companies uh, at the expense of uh, foreign ones, this is, of course, most clearly seen in the sectors that China continues strategic, uh, considers strategic, IT sector, advanced manufacturing, and, and so on. One related sort of phenomenon has been the growing sense that uh, major Chinese companies are becoming stronger competitors for U.S. and foreign firms, but they have achieved this as a result of support from the Chinese government uh, as opposed to sort of fair uh, competition. And that brings us, I think, to sort of where we are now and, and the outlook uh, for reform and opening. And interestingly, in my view, and, and David talked uh, about some of the goals of the third plenum, and, and you know, my view is that there's a lot of overlap, actually, between what, what the U.S. and U.S. companies, uh, the changes they would like to see in, in the Chinese system, and the goals of China's leaders as reflected in the third plenum in particular. Again, this notion that much more of the Chinese economy, and I don't think they're saying all of the Chinese economy, but much more of it should be driven by market forces uh, and by competition. Um, and, and for that reason, I think a timely implementation of the third plenum uh, uh, blueprint will address a significant portion, not all, but a significant portion of concerns that we hear uh, out of the business community. Again, as David noted, you know, the outlook uh, for uh, implementation of the third plenum uh, is uncertain. Uh, it will require massive changes, laws, policies, and even changes just in thinking and attitude in China. And we know that there are winners and losers in such a process. Uh, so it's going to be a tough fight, I think. Uh, for that reason, I will leave to other experts a uh, sort of prediction as to the, the specific outlook for reform and opening or the timing, but I would offer uh, thoughts on, on three points uh, as we look ahead. And the first relates to the difference between reform, which I see as primarily a domestic internal uh, activity, and this goes to the issue of fiscal reform, it goes to the issue of interest rate reform. Uh, the difference between reform and opening, uh, the opening piece being uh, opening the market, providing more market access for foreign firms, and generating competition from outside of China. And one of the concerns, I think, that foreign companies uh, now, and I know a number of uh, the members of the U.S. business community, are concerned that as the third plenum implementation goes forward, we may see a much heavier emphasis on reform with less of an emphasis uh, on opening. Uh, as one indicator of the attention that this issue is getting, the U.S.-China Business Council has begun a issuing a quarterly scorecard on implementation of third plenum or on the economic uh, reform and opening uh, policies, specifically with an eye to evaluating the impact on foreign companies. Their most recent scorecard was issued in October. Uh, they concluded that indeed there have been some reform measures implemented, but, and I quote, <clears throat> the policy uh, specifics do little to address core issues of concern to foreign companies. So one issue as we look forward is this kind of balance between reform and opening. 
Second relates uh, to the interaction between the rule of law and reform and opening. David spoke more broadly about political reform, I guess, and, and I wouldn't differ with his views. I, I would focus a little more narrowly on the, the legal reform area. Um, it's hard for me to see how third plenum goals uh, of market-driven growth and innovation can succeed without strengthening of the rule of law in China, at least as it relates to regulatory and commercial matters. And I understand there are much broader issues here of human rights and free expression and so on, and I think they're important, but at a minimum, it's a little difficult to see how you build the kind of dynamic economy and innovative economy that China wants without a strengthening of the rule of law. Among other things, human nature being what it is everywhere around the world, unless government actions are constrained by a set of, of transparent and fairly enforced rules uh, and regulations, uh, I, I think there'll always be enormous opportunities and a tendency toward corruption, uh, and in fact, for uh, actions that favor uh, companies that have particular relationships with the government, and this is, of course, tremendously distorting in terms of, of, of economics. Uh, the fourth plenum, of course, sought to address this to a certain extent, and as with the third plenum results, I think, you know, we will need to watch carefully and see how fourth plenum implementation goes forward. Uh, my third and final point relates to the interaction between reform and opening and broader U.S.-China relations. Over the last 30 years, the major U.S. multinational companies have clearly been a significant stabilizing force uh, in U.S.-China relations. Uh, and though they've often been unhappy and, in fact, very, very unhappy about particular Chinese policies, uh, for most of this period, uh, I think they've had a certain level of confidence that as they looked out to the medium and, and then the long term, uh, that China's trade and investment policies were moving in a direction that would present increasing opportunities for them in the China market. But as reform and opening was seen to have slowed, and as other issues emerged, uh, we've seen some change in attitude, I think, among the business community. And many companies have begun to have deeper concerns about the, the, the fundamental direction of China's trade and investment policies. The factors uh, in this kind of change of attitude include, as I mentioned, the, the sense that reform had, had slowed or stopped in the Hu Jintao and Jiabao administration, Questions then about the pace and scope of the current uh, reform and opening plans, third plenum and so forth. The cyber spying issue, and regardless of what one uh, thinks about that, I think it shook confidence significantly among uh, major uh, U.S. companies and caused them to question the fundamental uh, issues of, of China's policies. Uh, and then, um, most recently, a very recent surge <clears throat> in enforcement of Chinese laws on foreign companies in, in ways that appear to diverge uh, from international norms and practices. And, and this goes along also with a sense that economic nationalism is on the rise in China. One indicator of this was the September survey by the uh, American Chamber of Commerce in China in which 60% of the companies uh, polled said they feel less welcome in China now. And that 60% was up from 41% in the previous year. Uh, I'd emphasize that U.S. companies still support uh, strong U.S.-China relations, but they have begun to express more anxiety over the last few years uh, to the U.S. government. We often talk in the broader strategic area, we talk about growing mistrust. This, in my mind, is the parallel and equivalent uh, phenomenon in the commercial area, this concern. Um, finally, let me just say then that as we look ahead, uh, one item that is absolutely critical, and I consider it in some ways a, a subset of the third plenum almost, and that is the U.S.-China Bilateral Investment Treaty. Uh, uh, I think it is clearly a part of President Xi's thinking uh, as a tool to drive reform uh, within China. And I think that conclusion in a timely way of a high-quality bit 
will not only have enormous positive commercial and economic impacts, but it will also have very positive effects on broader U.S.-China relations uh, as it reinforces the notion that China is indeed committed to opening. So far, the negotiators feel they're making progress. I think we should all just hope that that continues and the deal can be wrapped up in a, in a timely way. Thank you. Uh, so I'm greatly honored to be here. Uh, I'm Tomo Marka from the sorry, University of Tokyo. And uh, I fully agree with David and Hank uh, that uh, reform is uh, very important for China to maintain its high uh, growth, like 6 to 7%. And... Uh, I would like to focus my talk on uh, what I think to be the most important part of the reform and also wh where the uh, biggest difficulties of reform are felt, and that is state-owned enterprise reform. Sorry. Uh, let me begin by uh, summarizing the trends in the past state-owned enterprise reform. I think uh, the biggest... Uh, advance in state-owned enterprise reform was been made, has been made during the latter half of 1990s when Zhu Rongji was in office. Uh, a, a privatization of small and medium-sized SOEs in local uh, uh, governments and also a drastic downsizing of workforce. But uh, since 1999, there has been a stagnation of reform and one reason, I think, is because of the decision made in 1999 that has stipulated that SOEs must assume dominant positions in so-called important industries and important sectors. So, uh, 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 in particular, after the year, the year 2009, when, the, when there was a global economic crisis, uh, uh, the state-owned enterprise asset has increased uh, as a percentage of GDP. And also, according to my estimate, uh, SOE's share in GDP has even increased, slightly increased, <coughs> since 2010. Uh, so, uh, I think it uh, it was a good news that uh, in uh, the third plenum last year, uh, uh, there was a, a great advance, at least in words, on SOE reform. So this uh, decision made in uh, the third plenum, plenum has uh, indeed created a new momentum for reform. So in this decision, it is written that state-owned enterprises no longer dominate uh, the important industries and important sectors. But uh, it is written uh, that the state will still invest in these industries. But there's no word like dominant. Uh, and also, uh, there's an interesting word uh, uh, mixed ownership and it seems to be that state-owned enterprises will be transformed into mixed, o mixed ownership firms and according to my, to my understanding that imply, this implies that a substantial portion of state-owned enterprise shares will be sold to private uh, in investors so uh, this uh, transition to mixed ownership is called Hungai in Chinese. And so uh, I, uh, reading Chinese newspapers, I see Hungai every week. week. Uh, 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 for, for example, the, the biggest central state-owned enterprises, 
Bryce, uh, the China National Petroleum Corporation announced that the, it will sell the its uh, gas pi pipeline network in eastern China, and the selling price is estimated to be around 230 billion RMB, which is a big amount. And uh, the second, perhaps the second largest SOE, uh, Sinopec, on a, uh, already sold 30% of its sales subsidiary to 25 shareholders. And uh, I think local government's Hungai plans or uh, mixed ownership plans are more aggressive than central SOEs. Shanghai government announced that all SOEs in Shanghai will be transformed into mixed ownership within three to five years. And Hebei province announced that there will be no lower limit of state ownership in uh, these uh, their uh, enterprises. And until, until now, uh, there haven't been uh, uh, good co coordination between uh, the different ministries in the central government. It seems that uh, everyone want uh, everyone uh, interpreted the meaning of mixed ownership at, as at, as they liked. So they they uh, were very different interpretation of the world. So uh, uh, only last month. Uh, the state council has finally set up the leading group for SOE reform. And uh, as soon as this uh, uh, organization was established, uh, there took place a discord between different ministries. And one dispute is about who will be the laobang or owner of the state-owned enterprises. The State Owned Assets Supervision and Administration Commission insists that they will be the owner, while the Ministry of Finance insists that they will be the or, or, or owner. And also, uh, there's a, there seems to be a discord between SASAC and the State Development and Reform Commission about the scope of uh, such reform. Uh, State Development and Reform Commission uh, seems to be insisting that the, in a wide range of industries uh, this uh, reform should be pursued, while Sasak seems to be very conservative. Uh, they don't want to be uh, want the central SOEs to be uh, privatized. So, uh, so I think. Uh, uh, this indicates that uh, there will still be uh, lots of conflicts, difficulties, especially when uh, the uh, government will want to pers uh, pursue uh, mixed ownership in the central SOEs. But on the other hand, uh, uh, I think there are good news uh, like uh, the mobile telecommunications uh, industry has uh, began to be uh, opened up to uh, many private uh, enterprises. And also the banking se sector. We saw five privately owned banks, including one uh, created by Alibaba, uh, has just entered the industry. So, generally speaking, I, I am uh, uh, rather optimistic about the privatization of uh, Chinese economy, although it will proceed uh, in a, mm, uh, very, very slowly. Well, uh, I, I would like to add an another word, uh, which is a comment uh, raised by a uh, uh, business leader in Japan, a couple of days ago, I, I uh, made a similar uh, presentation in front of Japanese business leaders. And one uh, uh, gentleman who actually had a uh, 
joint venture with a central SOE commented uh, that uh, this uh, mixed ownership will not work because it virtually means that uh, partial privatization. And in his view, private, partial privatization is nonsense. Only uh, full privatization works. And uh, also he raised the uh, problem of uh, personnel uh, problem. I mean, uh, the, the, the high-ranking uh, corporate leaders' uh, appointment is still dominated, controlled by the party. So um, if, if this problem is not solved, then uh, mix uh, even intro some introduction of private uh, capital uh, will not be so effective. And uh, I think uh, he, he is, uh, this person is very, uh, is, uh, based on his own uh, experience, he is qualified to make such comment. Okay, I will finish my presentation here. Thank you. Like we'll start with, uh, I'll ask a few questions and then I will open it up to, uh, for the audience. Um, three, three excellent presentations. Um, I'm going to start with a, a question on um, China's impact on uh, China's reemergence uh, and reform impact on the U.S. economy and the Japanese economy. Then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, SOE reform. And then, I'd, then, then I would uh, like to go to... Uh, Hank's uh, uh, point on the implications of, of uh, the changing uh, uh, business attitudes uh, and what that means for U.S.-China relations and, uh, and for reform and, and China's own goals for economic growth. So first, first um, I'd like to, 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 uh, uh, to go a little bit deeper on impact on uh, China's uh, economic growth and uh, you know, integration with U.S. and Japanese economies. Uh, and its impact was you know, specifically on U.S. manufacturing, on U.S. workers, on um, U.S. agriculture, uh, uh, innovation, and Japanese innovation, and, uh, and, on, um, and on consumers. Uh, and I'll let, let uh, each of you take uh, any piece of that, that that you would like. We'll start with you, David. Thank you. So the you know, question is the impact of China and its integration with the world economy on the U.S., particularly manufacturing. So, so I like to begin by saying we shouldn't exaggerate the influence of China on the U.S. economy. Until recently, China was much, much smaller than the U.S. economy. So if you're talking about the 1990s, for example, you know, China would have had an impact on some very specific industries in the U.S., like footwear, uh, you know, garments and footwear. But I think it's hard to see a macroeconomic effect of China on the U.S. That's, that's changing now that China is about a 10 billion economy, sorry, 10 trillion, U.S. is 16 trillion. So all the reforms that the three of us discussed, I think going forward, they really could have a significant effect on the U.S. economy. But up until recently, I think there's a tendency to exaggerate the impact of China on the U.S. economy. There's a long-term trend for manufacturing employment to decline as a share of the labor force for a lot of reasons. It's likely that China's emergence accelerated that trend a little bit, but I think the United States could have easily counteracted that with its own policy. So I prefer not to blame China for development, say, in U.S. manufacturing. I would blame the failure of U.S. policy. I guess I would uh, defer both to uh, David and Professor Murakawa on the, the economic um, aspects, but I would agree uh, with David's comments that often the negative impact of China probably tends to be exaggerated. And I just comment that, you know, there's kind of a saying in the trade policy world that, you know, the, the positive effects 
of more open trade and investment tend to be very widely distributed across the country, while the negative effects tend to be very focused. And so uh, certainly the big, the growth of imports from China, as I mentioned, has had a negative impact uh, on certain U.S. companies and certain industries for sure, and yet the positive inspect, uh, aspects, the, the, the raise in standard of living that we experience because of inexpensive Chinese goods, the ability over many years for the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates lower because of the inexpensive goods from China were keeping down inflationary pressures. These things tend to be spread out. And so I think there's kind of a natural political process here that tends to accentuate the negatives uh, and downplay the positives. Uh, and again, though, I certainly would, would uh, defer to David and Professor Murakawa, though, on the specifics. Professor Murakawa, with respect to uh, Japan? Uh, well, uh, from an economic perspective, I think uh, China's rise will be more, more, has more impact on Japanese economy because uh, China has long been Japan's largest trade partner. Uh, but uh, on the same, uh, uh, on at the same time, uh, uh, I think the, the even the people in the business community are uh, quite uh, afraid of China being so big because now it's uh, the com uh, country's economy is even bigger than us. So. Uh, I I was shocked that uh, last year uh, there was a, a public poll, or opinion poll, uh, to the the Japanese business people asking about their uh, their uh, prospects on the Chinese economy, and uh, nearly seventy percent of this uh, the people uh, asked. Uh, is uh, fo forecast that China will uh, face a big economic trouble within ten years or fi five or ten years, and uh, so uh, th this kind of uh, irrational sense, uh, I mean irrational uh, kind of uh, view on China. Thank you. Um, well, let's let's uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, China's SOE reforms. Uh, Professor uh, Markow, you you uh, mentioned that SOEs account for uh, probably about a quarter of, of China's GDP. Um, Nick Lardy, uh, one, uh, a distinguished economist at one of our partner institutions here uh, in DC, has has said that. You know, the one third to one quarter of GDP that uh, SOE uh, is constitute of is is relatively small. That the return on assets of state firms is is plummeting around 3.7 percent uh, in 2013, which is about half the cost of capital. He sees this as a as a huge drag on China's economic growth, particularly in in uh, where where state investment uh, in services where state investment exceeds uh, private investment. But he doesn't seem to worry too much about state capitalism. He, 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 he says that it's, it's more accurate to think of China as a market economy. Um, I would be I would, interested in, in all of your impressions uh, of that. Uh, and uh, start, start with Professor. Uh, well, I, I, I agree, basically agree with uh, the comment made by uh, Nick Lardy. Uh, that, uh, it, it seems to be a little bit exaggeration to call China as a state capitalist because, uh, because uh, the private sector has now perhaps uh, ne nearly 40% of the GDP is contributed by the private sector. So uh, uh, China is now, now uh, really a mixed economy mixed ownership economy. And, uh, uh, but uh, 
It is also true that the the what what they think what the government think as the important sectors are dominated by uh, the state-owned enterprises. So uh, uh, th there will be a uh, uh, great business opportunity created by a private at least partial privatization of the uh, state dominant dominant sectors. Thanks. I'd say that uh, certainly Nick Lardy's uh, economic analysis makes sense to me. I, I would draw a distinction, I guess, between the sort of economics of the, the issue and the policy dimensions. And I guess one could debate the question of how do you define a market economy? Is China a market economy? Of course, under US trade law, as a technical matter, China is not considered a market economy. But, but putting that, that sort of definitional issue, definitional issue aside, as I mentioned in my comments, I mean, the, the real problem is that the sense that the Chinese government uh, is intervening heavily in, in commercial matters uh, in ways that support and, and help develop Chinese companies, whether it's through mandated unique technical standards, whether it's through using the definition of a domestic product for the purposes of uh, government procurement, uh, whether it's uh, through the Strategic Emerging Industries Initiative pumping a lot of money uh, to certain Chinese firms. Uh, so uh, whether it's through the use of uh, China's anti-monopoly law or other regulatory policies. Uh, so, so, so the sense that the, 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 the extent to which the Chinese government is intervening in the economy uh, and, and the scope of that intervention specifically to help Chinese companies relative to foreign companies is a huge big policy issue. And, and so one could argue about kind of is China market economy or not, but I think that's the root of, of a lot of the US-China friction at this point. So I, I agree with Hank that there's a lot of intervention and in, you know, in my comments I chose to focus on distortions in factor markets, meaning you know, financial system and the labor market and some of the important product markets, the whole service, modern service sectors, you know, are, are distorted in the sense of being very closed and, and non-competitive. So I prefer to, you know, focus on some of those big distortions in government policies that have the effect of pushing both private firms and state firms and mixed firms, right? Those distortions push them all in the same direction. You know, if you have, uh, if you have very low interest rates, it pushes all these firms to overinvest. Right? If you've got distortions in the labor market that tend to keep wages low, that affects all these firms. I, my own experience in China is it's often very hard to figure out who owns something. You know, so the notion of you know, kind of what, what's a private firm, what's mixed, what's state, I think it's often very hard to tell. And unfortunately, I've known Chinese entrepreneurs who thought they owned an asset, you know, and then it was taken away by a corrupt local official. So it turns out they didn't own the asset. So I, I prefer to go with the distortions in these different markets you know, rather than to start from, from uh, who owns what. Let me just add a comment, if I could, picking up actually on the last comment that Professor Murakawa made in, in his presentation where he quoted a Japanese uh, business person. Uh, and, and that person, I think, uh, you know, hit on a, 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 an important distinction. You know, there is the question of ownership. And as David said, often it's hard to tell uh, who, who owns what. But, but the other issue is sort of behavior and how an entity is treated by the Chinese government. And, and so again, you know, if you partially privatize, but in fact, the Chinese government continues to support that entity uh, in, in, in to build it up as a national champion relative to foreign companies, <clears throat> you're just in the same position as if it had never been uh, privatized to any extent. So the, the real issue, I think, becomes our, enter our Chinese enterprises or enterprises that are wholly Chinese, uh, are they all operating on the same level playing field in the China market along with foreign companies or not? And that's in a sense separate from the ownership issue. But again, I think increasingly the US government and the US business community have focused on this sense of level playing field, equal treatment, putting aside, to a certain extent, the issue of ownership. So um, state-supported uh, 
enterprises uh, as opposed to state-owned enterprises. Right. If, 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 right. if the effect is to give them an unfair advantage, it doesn't matter whether the government actually owns them or not, I think would be the view. Professor Macau, could you comment more, um, Hank commented on the, the changing attitudes or, uh, of, of U.S. business. How are, how are Japanese uh, uh, business perceiving the opportunity and the, the risks uh, in China? And how has that changed over, over uh, time? Well, uh, uh, in, in the past, I think uh, many Japanese companies thought China as an export base. A place to make make things, not not sell things. But uh, nowadays, uh, more and more Japanese companies think China is a market. And uh, in in the coastal area, the per capita GDP has already surpassed ten ten thousand dollars. And and uh, in in that case, uh, the, the especially the services. Uh, which has developed in China, in Japan for uh, J Japanese uh, uh, middle or low income class is uh, has a very good chance of uh, creating a big market in, in China. So we see a lot of, for example, r ramen restaurants, change chains, and uh, 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 convenience store chains developing in China. So, uh, uh, the, so uh, uh, thinking, so thinking in this way, uh, more and more opportunities will be opened up for Japanese companies. Thanks. Uh, why is a, why is a bilateral investment treaty from a, from a, a U.S. standpoint important, so important? I've heard there seems to be consensus among many that uh, uh, a bilateral investment treaty is, the, is probably the, the most important negotiated instrument that the United States could uh, negotiate with China. Um, but um, such, a, such a treaty would need to uh, go through the Senate. Um, and uh, how, what do you think, why is it important, and what do you think are its prospects? Let, let me make a time. few economist points, and then the others can Good. make real points. Um, China is the second largest mm -hmm. recipient of foreign investment in the world after the United States. So it's the biggest developing country recipient. It has about 10% of the, all the stock of foreign investment in the world is in China. So it's been a major recipient. The United States is the largest provider of foreign investment to the world, but only 1% of U.S. foreign investment is in China. So the U.S. is severely underinvested in China. There are a lot of reasons. You know, some are generic, like poor intellectual property rights. But it's also the case that China is pretty open in manufacturing. But as I mentioned, it's extremely closed in a whole bunch of modern service sectors and energy and agriculture. So if you actually look at where the US tends to have its outward investment, which is not manufacturing, there's some of course, but the majority is in modern services and extractive industries, China is protected exactly in the sectors where the United States tends to be strong. So if we were gonna have a successful BIT, China would have to open up most of these sectors. That have to be a negotiation. The only way this is going to get through Congress is if most of these sectors open up. So it actually would create a lot of opportunities for U.S. firms, which which up till now have been locked out of the Chinese market. Right, I, I'd agree with all that. I, you know, the the core. There are many aspects to a bilateral investment treaty, but but the core of the issue at this point, I think, from the U.S. both government and business community perspective is this issue of dramatically removing uh, restrictions on U.S. Uh, foreign direct investment in China. Sectors that are now closed uh, to foreign investment will need to be open. Sectors where there are various types of restrictions will have to be further opened. For example, in the automobile sector, if you are an automobile uh, manufacturer, you can only go in in a joint venture with a Chinese partner, and you cannot own more than 50% of the venture. So, so these are the kinds of things. This is the, the core of the goal. Let me, let me note that uh, you know, Chinese officials themselves have spoken about the BIT as the most significant 
uh, negotiation and potential for change since China entered the WTO. Uh, it also, by the way, goes to the issue of SOE reform uh, because if you're dramatically opening so many sectors, it will require opening a lot of sectors that are today uh, dominated by SOEs. <coughs> With regard to the prospects in the Senate for the treaty, you know, it's to me, and, and there are folks I know around town here who've made very definitive statements, it'll never get through the Senate and so on. I, it's kind of silly to me. We're talking about uh, a process uh, that will not happen for probably at least a couple of years. Some feel that two years to finish the negotiations, in fact, is optimistic. But even if we assume two years, uh, it's not clear what the U.S. economy will be like then, and that will affect attitudes. It's not clear whether it'll be this administration or another administration. It's not clear what the administration's legislative priorities will be at that time. It's not clear what U.S.-China relations will be at that time. And, oh, by the way, we don't even have an agreement to talk about yet. And as David said, and I, I concur that the most important factor will be the agreement itself. And if it is an agreement which uh, clearly provides uh, enormous benefits to most of the concerned constituency, most of the major industry groups, those groups will mobilize uh, and will very actively work to get approval for the bid. Similar, on a smaller scale probably, but similar to, to, to what we saw when China's uh, permanent normal trade relations status uh, was being debated in the Congress as related to China's WTO accession. So I think speculation at this point is fine, but, but, but a definitive judgment on whether or not it can be approved uh, really has to wait till a little bit further down the road. Thanks, Hank. So why don't we open it up now to the audience? Uh, we'll have... Uh, a microphone, why don't you raise your hand uh, if you could identify yourself and uh, uh, pose a question rather than a, a, a statement. Can we start, start here? Uh, Bill Tucker, uh, I've taken... Uh, you have to identify your, yourself. Yeah, I'm a lawyer and, uh, and, and, and an international trade consultant and a former member of the White House Counsel's Office. I've taken uh, two uh, multinational insurance companies into China, uh, a New York Life and ING, the Dutch company. And um, they uh, uh, restricted you to Shanghai at the beginning and then uh, allowed you to expand out. Has that changed, number one? Because this was 10, 12 years ago. And... Uh, uh, we've also uh, represented some uh, companies uh, in regard to this majority ownership, and that's you know there's there's a simple way around that, and that's the if you get you know, fifty percent, you simply get a Chinese partner to get two or three percent, and then you own a majority interest. And we've done that with companies also. And so has that has that been employed by by companies going into China that you know of? I think on the insurance uh, on the insurance companies, uh, you know, heavy restrictions remain in the insurance sector. And my sense is overall that the U.S. insurance companies that have gone into the market, shall we say, have have not achieved the, uh, the the kind of goals they had hoped to achieve. It remains the case that, uh, with the exception, I guess, of AIG, which was grandfathered. Uh, you can't go in wholly owned. You have to have a Chinese partner, and I forget what the exact equity cap is. Uh, so, so that issue has not substantially changed. It remains the case also, I think, the insurance companies continue to have concerns about approvals of branches uh, with the sense that Chinese insurance companies can get group approvals pretty quickly. Foreign companies are getting them much more slowly and one at a time. So there continue to be uh, a number of challenges. Again, these kinds of issues will very much be uh, at the center 
of the BIT negotiations, of the BIT negotiations in the financial services area with regard to how you structure a deal. Can you sort of gain effective control even though you're capped at 50 percent? I, I think companies do a lot of different things. I would just say that I think, you know, if, if you ask most of the U.S. companies involved, given the preference, they'd rather have the opportunity to come in wholly owned, and that would make their lives much simpler. So as I say, that will be an important goal across many sectors uh, as the bid negotiations go forward. And, uh, and a bid negotiation could become uh, you know, part of a, a template uh, for a broader free trade agreement uh, for Asia, which uh, the President uh, has said that it supports in the long run. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we get um, three questions from the back, and uh, why don't we start? Hi, I'm Philippe Leco. I'm a fellow with the Center on the United States and Europe at Brookings. I'd like to ask uh, the speakers, um, one, one issue has not been mentioned is the uh, overseas investment by um, um, state-owned enterprises and private enterprises in China. And I'd like to see whether uh, th th this is uh, this is seen as as a as a, as a threat by by Japanese and American companies, and uh, generally their assessment on the sectors involved. Right. And can we get two more questions? We're going to just start uh, work our way up from the from the back. Thank you. Um, my name is um, Kakumi Kobayashi with uh, Kyodo News of Japan. Um, I'm wondering if any of you talk a bit about the Chinese uh, ambitions of Chinese um, or interest in a uh, free trade area in the Pacific. And, uh, and now the, uh, the US the Republicans are controlling the Congress and every, many people expect a new kinds of momentum on the TPP negotiations. But uh, if, but, but if uh, the TPP negotiations have, uh, will not be able to f make, fail to make progress, in in the first half of the next year or something, uh, do you think would that encourage China to take some actions uh, to create the the new uh, similar kind of Pacific trade area that China is seeking? Some by doing something like the talking um, Singapore and Malaysia uh, into um, seeking something new. Something. Thank you. Good. And uh, one more. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Hermes. I would just ask a question about the impact of the China's economical growth on the military development. China's military development? Yes. The relationship's impact. Okay. Um, so on foreign, uh, foreign direct investment, uh, David, do you want to... Uh, so, yeah, let me lead off. Um, so the first question was about China's overseas investment. You know, China's overseas investment is growing very rapidly. If you look at the destinations, if you leave aside Hong Kong, which I think is kind of a special case because a lot of that Chinese money, you know, just goes through Hong Kong and ends up elsewhere in the world. The U.S. is the number one destination for Chinese investment. And it's going into all different sectors. China bought the largest pork producer in the U.S. They bought a mid-sized bank in California. They're buying high tech. You know. So the U.S. is a very open economy. And there's a tremendous amount of Chinese investment coming in, such that within a few years, if these trends continue, there'll be more Chinese investment in the U.S. than there is U.S. direct investment in China. Now, that's a little bit strange because worldwide, the U.S. has 10 times as much overseas investment. So you know, it comes back to the point I made, there's relatively little U.S. investment in China. What I say to Chinese friends is it's hard to see that pattern continuing if China doesn't open up. The U.S. side is likely to start to feel that this is a whole new imbalance that's developing you know, with China coming in investing in our economy. So I welcome Chinese investment as I welcome other direct investment. But I would like to see China open up reciprocally, and that's something that uh, the bilateral investment treaty that we've mentioned several times, that, that's something it would definitely do. Should we comment on several of them? Or, yeah. Okay. Yes. A, a few quick thoughts then. One on the outbound Chinese uh, foreign direct investment. And part of the question was, you know, is this viewed as a threat? And I guess I could say that, you know, no company... Uh, likes to see new competitors uh, arising. And so certainly uh, U.S. multinationals are not uh, happy uh, to see 
Chinese companies more active in foreign markets. But again, this comes down to the basic issue of fairness, in a sense, or perception of fairness. If Chinese state-owned companies are competing uh, globally <clears throat> on an equal basis with other multinationals, what can you say about it? Uh, the other multinationals may not be happy to see the competition, but that's the way that it goes. <clears throat> the perception, of course, is that very often many of the Chinese companies, w whether they're, they're getting help at home or have a protected market at home, or they're getting uh, some types of uh, you know, foreign assistance or assistance that helps them in foreign markets and so on. So to the extent this is perceived as an un yet another uh, example of unfair competition, then, then it's a significant uh, policy issue. With regard to uh, the free trade, I mean, the Chinese are already uh, actively pursuing uh, other free trade ar arrangements, and I don't think that the success or failure <clears throat> of the TPP is going to affect their calculation. Uh, in other words, I think uh, they, they want to be more activist internationally, broadly speaking. They want to pursue more free trade agreements, whether it's their participation in the RCEP uh, or, or, or other mechanisms. Uh, you know, uh, my, my own personal hope would be that at some point these regional mechanisms can all merge and China can be a part of uh, the same arrangements the U.S. is, uh, but we'll have to see. But I think China is, is, is seasoned in its interest to pursue such initiatives and is doing so. With regard to the impact of the growth of the Chinese economy on military development, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, as the country has more money, I guess they can put more money into military. I mean, the one aspect to me is that, that I find interesting is, of course, you know, China's economic development has been based very much on its integration into the global economy. That involves state-owned enterprises investing in Africa. It involves import of huge amounts of uh, natural resources from abroad to fuel the Chinese economy. And so while much of the Chinese military development, as I understand it, is focused on the immediate area around China, uh, on the other hand, some of the military development, it seems to me, development of a Blue Water Navy and so on, is also uh, aimed at this notion of now if we're going to have global economic interests, we want to be able to evacuate our workers uh, from a country in Africa if there's war and revolution. We want to be able to protect the sea lanes of communication that are bringing all these resources to, uh, to, to China. So, so I think in terms of what China is doing in the military area, uh, there are some implications. Uh, beyond that, uh, again, I defer to others who are probably more expert in the area. Professor Murka, any comments on <clears throat> any of the three questions? Uh, yeah, so I, I will only comment those that I can uh, say something. For, first is on the foreign direct investment made by the Chinese. Uh, I think uh, this if a foreign direct investment has many aspects. And uh, of course, the state-owned enterprise are making big investments, especially in the resource area. But also, there are lots of small entrepreneurs. Uh, and uh, actually, we have created a database of uh, China's FDI. And, uh, and an interesting thing is that uh, neighboring provinces uh, 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 th those from the provinces go to neighboring countries so that for example from Yunnan to Laos Yunnan to Myanmar and lots of lots of small obscure entrepreneurs uh, so uh, uh, it, I, I don't know what they are actually doing and uh, with regards to the threat uh, well, for Japan, uh, this uh, it seems that the very few Chinese companies are actually competing with the Japanese. For example, uh, those going to Africa, perhaps uh, very few Japanese companies dare invest in Africa. So, uh, so uh, perhaps uh, the Chinese are more aggressive in, in going into these developing less developed countries while uh, the Japanese are more conservative so uh, so uh, and uh, unlike the United States Chinese has very few investment in Japan 
Oh, we, we, we can, uh, uh, and those already done by Chinese are mostly small, small ones. So uh, there, there, there's, uh, seems that there's not so many, uh, 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 so much sense of threat uh, created by Chinese uh, FDI. And uh, well, uh, briefly on the free trade agreement issue, I think a country like China with this strong manufacturing force, uh, it would be natural for them, uh, it would be beneficial for its uh, industry to have more and more free trade. So. Thank you. And just one, one more comment on, uh, what, on uh, does the United States fear uh, greater foreign direct investment uh, China, uh, I would say just the opposite. Uh, you know, the Commerce Department uh, president has, has kicked off a program coordinating with all the other federal agencies uh, to promote foreign direct investment uh, in the United States called Select USA. In fact, t today or, or, or last yesterday evening, um, uh, the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade, which is the major, uh, one of the two major economic and trade dialogues between the United States and China was held in Chicago uh, uh, and uh, has been uh, vamped to put much more emphasis on business participation. <coughs> and uh, one of the themes this year is uh, investment. Uh, and it's no accident that uh, it's in Chicago. Uh, and uh, uh, now direct investment in the United States is not something the federal government has been has much experience in promoting, where we have experience in promoting exports, but it's the cities of the United States and it's the states who have that experience uh, and who are hungry uh, for the invest, in fact, compete uh, uh, for foreign investment. So, you know, uh, yeah, the U.S. government believes that, uh, you know, in a, in a time when, um, you know, jobs are important uh, and, uh, uh, the economic issues with China are vast and some of them very difficult that uh, you know, foreign investment in the United States and things like tourism, promoting tourism, they are, they are the low-hanging fruit uh, to promote because we are an open economy. We are uh, making steps to make, make ourselves even more open with respect to, you know, granting of visa, longer-term visas for business and, and travelers. Uh, so again, the uh, U.S. remains open and welcoming to, to foreign direct investment. So I think we have uh, extinguished our time, unfortunately. Uh, we are now moving on to uh, the political and security Lesser issues. panels. Well, thank you very much, Malcolm, for uh, your great chairing. Thanks to each of the presenters. Um, we're not going to move right away to the uh, discussion of Chinese domestic politics. We will have a 15-minute uh, coffee break, so please partake of the refreshments in the back. And we'll reconvene uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you. Your place, I know that was there. So.
So, was it right? So, I'll start that point. The other the
I was already out of Could I uh, encourage everyone uh, to refill their coffee as required, but then uh, take their seats again? Good morning. Uh, I'm Jonathan Pollack, uh, senior fellow in the John L. Thornton China Center and also in the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. Now that we've dealt with the simple questions of economics, uh, we can 
we can go on to uh, to the main event. I'm, of course, uh, only joking slightly, uh, but uh, I do think uh, that uh, questions now about China's current political circumstances, uh, leadership arrangements, uh, power alignments, and so forth are very, very much uh, on the minds of all of us, all of the, all of us who study uh, China. Uh, and we're really very, very pleased to have this meeting here today because I think comparing and analyzing uh, the views uh, as seen from both Japan and, and the United States, uh, it seems to me, is essential. Um, the order in which we will go today reflects in some measures the, the content that will be covered in the briefings, um, but I think we will allow for the three presenters each to give an overview to the audience about their arguments. Uh, we will then proceed to a panel discussion here, which I'm sure will be very lively. So the sequence is we will begin with Professor Kamo uh, from, from Keio University, uh, then uh, Professor Takahara from Tokyo University, and then my colleague Ken Lieberthal uh, will, will uh, give the concluding presentation, and then we will proceed to discussion and questions and answers. So uh, the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tomoki Kamo uh, from Keio University, Japan. So thank you very much for uh, giving me a great opportunity to exchange and develop my views on China. So today I would like to discuss about the, the Xi Jinping's and, and, and Xi Jinping's power. The, my presentation title is The Understanding Seeds Centralized Power. So, since the beginning of the Seeds regime, uh, there have been uh, obvious change in the po uh, policy decision making mechanisms. So, decision making authority is highly centralized to, to, to Xi Jinping. And for example, uh, Xi monolize decision making mechanism. So Xi Jinping is, is uh, heading new and old leading um, small groups, including national security commission. So we can say that centralized decision making is mechanisms, but it is difficult, I think it is difficult to say uh, she has successfully uh, consolidated his power. Um, concentration of the decision-making power on the C's hands, not only C, but also other members of the Politburo Standing Committee request E. So among the party uh, leadership, they have been a sharing sense of insecurity about the condition of of, of country. They also sharing, uh, they, they are also sharing desire for a strong and decisive leader. So I think she concentrated decision making authority, but she's power is not personalized power because on past 20 years, CCP regime is promoting the institutionalization. And first one, institu institu institutionalization con uh, constraints are working. For example, now C could not overcome term limit and age limit. And second one is intra-party democracy is also working. So as you know, C is, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, he is the first elected party leader. Uh, how can I say, it was mid-May 2012, senior member of the CCP held, on, uh, held an internal poll. He received the highest approval rating. 
even though he got the highest approval rating, we can say that at the beginning of the Seize regime, he does not have enough authority to grip political power firmly because he, she is not Zhang and Zhang Zemin and Hu Jintao. And Zhang and Hu, they were nominated as successor by Deng Xiaoping. He can, we can say that Xi Jinping is a one of the, the consensus based lineup. So if she want to consolidate his power, she have to create an authority by himself. Now he launched an anti-corruption campaign trying to eliminate his rival. And, and so, yes. And we want to understand about Xi's power and the stability of Xi's regime. We should pay more attention to not only um, decision making mechanism, but also correct information mechanism, uh, correct information mechanisms. Currently, uh, CCP is trying to activate democratic institutions, especially in local politics. CCP has made use of democratic institutions as a means to correct the information for decision making. For example, People's Congress and P CPPCC, Chinese People Political Consultative Conference. And currently, so Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping regime building several mechanisms of dialogue with non-party elite. And um, why it is important for understanding Chinese politics? So because the member of the democratic institutions come from a variety of different background. And democratic institutions perform a wide variety of political functions, for example, serve as agent to government. So member of the democratic institutions transmit to policy to the, the constituencies and several uh, serve as uh, demonstrators and convey the, the information to government and serve as uh, representatives, represent to the uh, interest of the constituencies. Okay, so, so, okay, yeah. Okay, I would like to wrap up my presentation. So, how can I say, she has successfully reinforced his power foundation by centralizing decision-making mechanisms. But at, at the same time, CCP have been promoting institutionalization, so uh, restrict Xi's power. So we can say Xi's leadership and Xi's regime looks stable, but I think there is some problems. So the prob problem is there. And gathering, so how can I say, information for decision making, she uh, decision makings. So she regimes need more alive, um, alive who uh, convey the information to government and the CCP. But so currently, Xi Jinping launched a uh, anti-corruption campaign has caused change the behavior of bu bureaucracy and 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 how can I say interest groups. That is the, the, the big challenge to the big challenge is the regime. Oh so my presentation is that oh thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like first to extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, Richard Bush uh, for inviting us and providing us with this great opportunity. Um, and thanks also to uh, Kevin 
Scott for the very good preparations. Um, and thank you all for coming. I believe uh, you are very busy now uh, on the eve of the holiday seasons, I understand? So you must have a lot of things to do. But unfortunately, holiday is a word that does not exist in the dictionary of Japanese experts on China. Uh, so we can only uh, come up with presentations, uh, not presents, um, to, to give. But I hope you will uh, in, enjoy our presentations. Now, um, my focus is on CCP and Xi Jinping's leadership. Uh, and I would like to begin by touching on uh, what are the tasks that Xi Jinping has held for himself? Because in order to evaluate uh, Xi Jinping's leadership, I think it's uh, helpful and useful to remember what his major tasks are. Now, uh, they were indicated in the definition of core interests that were presented by a man called Dai Bingo, the former state councillor, four years ago. Uh, these uh, major tasks have not changed, I, I believe. Uh, in the recent years. And uh, Dai Bingo said that there were three major elements of the so-called core interests, as you see on the slide. Uh, the first element is political system and political stability, <coughs> which would include the leadership of the CCP, the socialist system, socialism with Chinese characteristics, and so on and so forth. And the second element of the core interests uh, consists of sovereignty, security, territory, and national uh, unity. And the third element is the basic assurance of the sustainable development of the economy and society. We can make an interesting comparison uh, with the party's basic line uh, that was defined under Deng Xiaoping and Zhao Ziyan in the 1980s, and that's also written on the slide. Uh, one center, that is economic construction, and two basic points uh, consisting of the four basic uh, socialist uh, political principles like uh, party leadership, uh, the road of socialism, and so on. And the other basic point was the reform and opening. And uh, it's interesting uh, to see the change in emphasis because the change, you know, uh, in, in the uh, three elements of the core in interest, we see more concern uh, in the party about the stability of uh, politics and the larger role that nationalism is playing uh, in the party's thinking and governance. I, I suppose the difference uh, is a reflection of those uh, concerns and the new role that nationalism has been playing uh, recently. Now, the next point is about uh, the major one major characteristic of uh, Xi Jinping's government. And by the way, there's not much a logical flow in the presentation that I'm giving. I'm trying to respond to a set of uh, a long list of questionnaires that I received from Richard. <laughs> and uh, I'll go one by one, but I, I think it could be useful in uh, arousing some dis discussion uh, after my, uh, the end of my uh, presentation. But next I'll talk about an important aspect of Xi Jinping's administration. I call it the Red Second Generation Administration. Now, what does Red Second Generation Hong Ardai mean? Well, it means uh, this generation is the offspring of the revolutionaries. And one characteristic of these people is that they hold an identity as successors to the revolutionary principles. And they have a very powerful sense of ownership of the system, uh, I, I would say. Uh, well, this is some kind of a display of socialism with Chinese characteristics, because it much depends on, in Chinese, it would be shui tong zhu yi, the uh, belief in lineage, as it were, the belief in blood. Uh, that's very feudal, I would say, but, but still in the political culture of China today, it is very important to be an offspring of the revolutionaries. And this compares with the concept of princelings, tai zi dan, uh, what does Tai Zedan mean? Also, the offspring of the revolutionaries. So the definitions are the same, but the connotations are rather different because when we say Tai Zedan, it implies that they are holders of common political and or economic in interests. Now, I said that Hong Ardai, well, Xi Jinping, of course, is a Hong Ardai. As, as, as we know, they hold their identity as successor to the revolutionary principles. 
but what about Xi Jinping? Yes, I would say he's one of those. Uh, he is somebody who experienced the hardships of the Cultural Revolution, but I would say that uh, his experience and his father's experience are rather different uh, things. Uh, you know, his father used to be one of the vice premier of the PRC, one of the revolutionaries, and he went through a lot of hardship together with people like Deng Xiaoping. Um, and they would never think of reusing concepts that were used uh, very much by Mao and his clique uh, during the Cultural Revolution. But as we see in the cases of Bo Xilai, for example, or with, with Xi Jinping now, uh, they don't hesitate to use the ideas and principles that were there uh, and the concepts that were there uh, during the Cultural Revolution. Because I think that's because the, their experience, the Hong Ardai's experience of the Cultural Revolution is not completely negative, but they see it as an experience through which they were trained. Uh, they went through this and they, were success they successfully overcame, overcame this hardship that they, were, uh, they had to go, go through. And, and that's a very important difference that I find. Now, the next point is about different perspectives on high-level politics. I would say, in the case of Japan, maybe it's the same in the United States, I don't know, but there are two ideal types as to different perspectives on high-level politics. And on the one hand, there is the institution school, Seido Gakuha or Jirudo Shuepai, uh, meaning that they see high-level politics mainly through institutions. The development of institutions is so important uh, in understanding what goes on in Chinese politics now. That's their view. But on the other hand, on the other extreme side, there is the power struggle school, Toso Gakha or Dou Zheng Shui Pai, who tend to see high-level politics as power struggle. Uh, and if you understand past struggle, you do understand most of what goes on uh, in Chinese uh, politics or Chinese policy making. Uh, for example, uh, they would have different interpretations about Hu Jintao's full retirement at the 18th Party Congress two years ago. The Seidu Gakka Judo Shuepai Institution School would say that that's very natural because of um, the uh, terms you know, they, uh, because of the age, and uh, the age limit, uh, because of the terms that they have uh, for being a member of the uh, Politburo, and also because there is this principle that the party commands the gun, and therefore oh, the case of Jiang Zemin 10 years before was an exception. And this is how it should be, that uh, uh, it would be wrong if uh, Hu Jintao remained as the chairman of the CMC, uh, the Central Military Commission, and gave the position of uh, general secretary only to uh, Xi Jinping. But the Dou Zhen Shui Pai, the power struggle school, would say that that happened purely because of the way that power tussle rolled out. Uh, so those are very different views. And perhaps the reality is somewhere in between. Uh, we cannot completely neglect uh, the uh, element of power struggle when we understand Chinese politics, I would say. Uh, we all know that uh, personal connections are so important uh, and forming groups or faction, uh, factions is really a part of uh, life uh, in China. So groups, factions... Uh, formed along uh, similar backgrounds or work experiences, so they tend to share uh, very similar policy preferences or policy tendencies. Uh, so institutions are important, I acknowledge, but we cannot ignore the existence of these uh, personal uh, groupings or factions, I would say. Are there divisions in the leadership now? Um, well, we are reminded of the open disagreements that uh, were quite obvious uh, during uh, Hu Jintao's administration, particularly the second uh, administration that began in 2007. And up to now, meaning um, in the two years, in the past two years, ever since she became the general secretary, it seems as if the uh, divisions, the disagreements have died down, but I would say that they only suppressed uh, under the uh, concentration of power on the part of Xi. And the serious uh, issues that existed, uh, that were debated so fiercely uh, in the past, for example, 
uh, SOE reforms, we touched on that in the earlier session. Uh, political reform, you remember Wen Jiaobao repeatedly uh, arguing very forcefully that political reform is necessary to thoroughly implement economic re reforms. Um, that debate is dormant now also. What about the de uh, fierce debate over universal values? I think that's still very much alive. Are there any concepts such as universal values? One side would say yes, the other side would say no. And also the low profile, the Tao Wan Yang Hui uh, foreign policy, the big debate I believe uh, s still goes on to this day. And uh, in fact, there is a widening gap, I would say. This is pretty obvious. There's a widening gap between the left, uh, who would um, pay more attention to uh, orthodox ideology, uh, who tends to be critical more about the defects of reform and opening. Um, they are growing the, uh, in force. They are increasing their voice. I think that's quite clear. But on the other side of uh, the story, there are the rights people who would argue that more reform is necessary uh, in order to solve the difficulties that the system is facing. And what's interesting to me is this debate between the left and the right is linked uh, to the debate over uh, foreign policy or external policies. Uh, this is one banner that was uh, hung in a village uh, in the suburbs of Xi'an uh, three years ago, and it reads, uh, Western uh, universalists must get out of China. Uh, and it's very surprising that this debate over universal values uh, have gone down to the village level. Um, it takes me about 15 minutes to ex explain why this banner <laughs> showed up in this village. But anyway, uh, you know, the linkage between the debate over political reform and the debate over uh, how much uh, Western things or concepts they are going to introduce to the Chinese society is quite linked. Uh, and that, I think, is a very important point. We also saw uh, photos of Mao Zedong in the anti-Japanese demonstrations that took place two years, years ago. That's also a, uh, a, a sign of the linkage. Now, what about the relationship between the party and society, or issues of governance and the stability of society? Well, uh, what's happening now is not rule of law or being promoted, but uh, in fact, it is more ruled by law, as we all know, and also by force. Uh, party leadership, it's party leadership, stupid. That kind of uh, emphasis on party leadership has been pretty obvious, I would say. Not only by law and by force, ruled by law and by force, but sometimes by not telling the truth. Uh, one example is this picture. You know, uh, when Xi Jinping visited Germany in March this year, there was a gift given by Prime Minister Merkel to Mr. Xi, uh, which was the map on the left side. That's the map uh, made in 1735. Very beautifully done and very well done, very accurate map. Uh, very high quality when we think of the uh, year that, that it, it was made. It was 1735. It's a very nice present. But uh, when Xinhua reported about the president, um, it reported, I mean, the right map was dis distributed. I mean, you, you can still find the map when you go to, if you go to the website there. Um, and this is really not necessary. I mean, the right side map, of course, includes Tibet. It includes Xinjiang, but actually this map was made in the 19th century, after Qianlong, uh, so this is wrong. Uh, but they don't have to, fe I personally feel that they don't have to fear the people so much, uh, but they, uh, they are just worried that if they tell the truth, it won't be received very well by the public. Um, and at the moment, the iron fists of Xi Jinping and Wang Qishan, uh, his friend, and with, with whom Xi Jinping shared a, a bed and a quilt during the Cultural Revolution when Xi Jinping visited uh, Wang, Wang Qishan uh, in, the, uh, in, in Shanxi province. Uh, so they've been pals for, from very young, young days. Uh, they are suppressing any dissident voices uh, through uh, force in both party and society. But that's the situation for the time being. But uh, can they really last? Um, can they institutionalize these anti-corruption measures or not? 
And a lot of the Chinese themselves were looking forward to the results of the fourth plenum, but uh, the expected, expected or the hoped results didn't really come out. And I'm, I'm coming towards the end. Um, and I think um, I've been living in China for the past two months or so. I am now a visiting sc scholar at the uh, Peking University. And I really feel that people are changing. The last time I lived in Beijing was from 1996 to 1998. And they have a stronger desire for equality, democracy, and fairness. If you just had a quick look at this interesting survey that was conducted by the Institute of Sociology of the Chinese Academy of Sci uh, Social Sciences last year, they were asking what should be the standards for judging what a good society is. And, and the answers, I mean, the, per the people who answered the questionnaire could choose four or five uh, choices from a list of uh, values. And most of these choices, the values consisted of the so-called socialist core values that the party is now promoting. And the top was equality. People want e e wanted equality most. And second was democracy. Uh, God knows what they had in their mind when they voted for democracy. Uh, but number three, wealth and strength. And number four, civilization and fairness and justice. And patriotism only came at eighth place. So I do wonder if Xi Jinping, in his attempt to unite the nation, unite the party through nationalism, uh, arousing nationalistic sentiments through his promotion of the concept of the China dream will succeed or not. And I find that in China, increasingly, uh, people are worried about their future. Thank you very much. Thank you. This, uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to uh, participate in this panel, and I think this panel and the previous panel have provided an, an enormous array of insightful comments about both substance and process uh, regarding uh, China's development under Xi Jinping. Uh, I will say it's a little hard for me to differentiate clearly a Japanese view versus an American view here. I think the on both sides, there's an overlap in, in trying to sort out the complexity of what is going on in China now. And uh, with that in mind, I'll give you my view. I happen to be an American. Uh, but you'll see strands of a variety of, of the presentations we've heard to date uh, woven together uh, in the remarks uh, I want to make. Uh, let me... Uh, divide my presentation in two parts. One is at the center in China, at the national level. Here, I think Xi Jinping clearly recognizes, accepts the reality that structural reforms are necessary for China's economy, for many of the reasons we heard on the first panel, and that the growth model of the last several decades, while successful for its time, is not sustainable and indeed has created problems that now really are major challenges uh, for the coming decade. Uh, Xi has also rapidly centralized agenda-setting initiatives in his own hands. He's been, I think, extremely skillful uh, in, uh, in being able to uh, drive the major objectives uh, that the system is now committed to uh, over the coming eight to 10 years. Uh, and he's pursuing a vigorous anti-corruption campaign, I think in part to consolidate his power, but in part also because corruption has, been, has become such a huge uh, issue in party support, and it has become predatory in a way that also uh, makes it more difficult to carry out the reforms that really are necessary uh, for the sustainability of the system. Uh, so he's, he's quickly sees the initiative, and we've all seen how dynamic a leader he has proven to be. And the anti-corruption campaign clearly has been a major consistent theme uh, right from day one of uh, his assuming top power. Uh, but turning the directions and scope of reforms into actual concrete policies has proven, not surprisingly, even at the center, to be a difficult task. And one thing I learned 
very early on uh, doing interviews in China back in the 1980s uh, was the reality that for officials at all levels of the system, uh, rhetoric is shaped by these broad goals, but actions are shaped by the concrete policies. Uh, they look for what specifically they have to do, what their specific requirements are within their jobs, and that is a key motivator for uh, how they actually perform. So that overall, not surprisingly, we've seen a relatively moderate pace of adoption of detailed policies uh, uh, in pursuit of the broad goals uh, articulated by the third plenum. Uh, the bottom line, therefore, at the center, to my mind, is that she is very strong in terms of shaping the overall objectives, but is not in a position to simply dictate actual policies to achieve those objectives. Those are subject to a process, and many of those are still being debated uh, and will be for quite some time because they're very difficult issues uh, to resolve. I think, though, the tougher uh, issues in terms of how the reforms will actually play out uh, concerning implementation of these policies through the provinces, cities, counties, and townships, uh, where you have over 30,000 uh, political units, territorial political units, uh, each with a party leader, each with a, with a relatively articulated uh, bureaucratic apparatus, each with a lot of local rules and regulations that apply in their locality. Uh, keep in mind that more than 75% of government expenditures in China take place from the provincial level on down, not by the center. So while the center collects a lot of the money, uh, the responsibilities for spending that money on programs are really driven by the provincial and lower levels because that's where most of the activity actually takes place. Uh, if you look at these levels below the center, at the bottom four levels of China's five-level political system, from center to province, to city, to county, to township. Uh, there are some basic realities of uh, policy making and policy implementation that I think it's uh, important to keep in mind. Uh, within each locality, within each county, within each township, going up the line within each uh, city and province, uh, the top party leader, the party secretary, uh, has enormous power and latitude within the broad uh, framework of, of uh, larger policies set at a higher level. The key incentives for heads of territorial party committees have been within their own locality to produce GDP growth every year while maintaining social stability, which is not necessarily easy given the policies uh, driven by rapid GDP growth uh, as a top goal, and avoiding incidents that embarrass the system as a whole, avoiding major scandals and that kind of thing. Uh, policy, so that at each level you have a powerful leader who really has a great deal of latitude uh, and is accustomed to exercising it and is rewarded for producing GDP growth every year while maintaining social stability and avoiding major scandal. Uh, policy implementation, moreover, is level by level, which is to say that you don't have the center directing a county as to what to do. The center will send out its uh, rules to the provinces which will then transmit them to cities, then to counties, then to townships, with a considerable amount of latitude acting in the spirit of the policy at each level. For many local le level leaders, finally, uh, the last 15 years have been great. Uh, these have been years overall where the system has worked well for them. They've had extensive authority, they've had pretty clear success criteria, and they've had the ability to amass major wealth for them and their families uh, as they have met those success uh, criteria. Uh, and since those criteria have been criteria for promotion, uh, you find now that uh, people who have the key party positions, you know, the top party leader in each uh, territorial unit up through the provincial level are people who have shown themselves to be very capable very pragmatic, can-do kinds of people, but have been promoted on the basis of their ability to 
produce the results that the last 20 years have called for. Many of the reforms and the anti-corruption campaign itself are thus unwelcome, threatening, and potentially require very different skills to do well in the future. Uh, so that while the at the top there, you know, at the top of the center, there is a key, clear understanding of the importance of structural reforms. As you go down through the key leadership in provinces, cities, counties, and townships, that awareness is uh, is understood but not pressing. Uh, the uh, it obviously varies by locality, but uh, overall, this is not uh, a a, uh, a a set of uh, political leaders uh, who have felt that this system must change in order to do well. Now, she can use the centralized party secretary system, uh, use CCP leadership to overrule local bureaucratic routines and local personal networks and drive a limited level, a limited set of agenda items, uh, you know, through political means. Uh, but frankly, uh, a problem that they have here is that other than the uh, anti-corruption campaign, most of the objectives that they have laid out for the next eight to 10 years uh, have not effectively been translated into operational success criteria for local level leaders. Uh, so, and in fact, many of these objectives broadly have different implications for local leaders. Uh, so don't engage in a, in a lot of investment, but don't let unemployment get high. Uh, do increase urbanization, uh, but at the same time uh, pay attention to environmental pollution, but urbanization requires construction of a lot of infrastructure and that kind of thing. There are just all kinds of contradictions uh, in these broad mandates from the perspective of a local level leader in trying to figure out what he or she will really be evaluated on and will uh, move ahead in the system on. Uh, also, many of those new priorities are very difficult given the way the system has functioned to date in that they stress, at the end of the day, quality over quantity, but the system has been very good at measuring quantity over quality, and uh, require uh, effective cooperation among different territorial units uh, across the boundaries of those units but the system to date has really rewarded having your own unit do well and have the externalities as much as you can pushed onto other units, uh, neighboring downstream counties and so forth. Uh, so again, it, it kind of fights against a lot of the fundamental structures, incentives, and capabilities that have been seen as key to the success of the development model over the last several years. The big exception to ability to implement all this to date has been the anti-corruption campaign, in no small part because that has teeth, it brings severe consequences to its targets, and it has at least some identifiable criteria. Uh, but there's a long history of anti-corruption campaigns that, produce, that have produced substantial but inevitably temporary effects. Uh, and typically, uh, one of the effects of those campaigns has been to dampen initiatives by local leaders who potentially, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to dampen an initiative by local leaders who don't want to call attention to themselves, uh, but then that creates problems for the reforms that are seeking local leaders, uh, local leader initiatives and experimentation. And it also generally disrupts bottom-up transmission of accurate information uh, because again, People don't want to uh, get caught off uh, where their careers may be at stake uh, in a politically tense environment. Now, over time, one of the elements of the reform effort is to reduce the role of government by enhancing the scope of the market, enhancing the scope of the private sector, and enhancing inputs from civil society. Uh, to the extent that that occurs over time, that can mitigate some of the problems that I've just uh, been focusing on. But I think these changes to reduce the role of government 
will overall take a substantial period of time and are going to be constrained by two important uh, competing priorities. One is simply the priority of limiting risk to the system. It's a very big, complicated system, and the top leaders are well aware of problems of market failure and that kind of thing. And secondly, the determination, at least at this point, to keep the agenda, substance and timing, in the hands of the core party leadership at each level, which isn't totally contradictory to the notion of pulling back on, on government intervention and allowing the market a bigger role and so forth, but it tends to play out that way. There is a real tension, re, you know, really it's a little bit some of the comments that David Dollar uh, was making in his presentation. So the bottom lines are, A, the broad reform agenda is very wide-ranging, consequential, and necessary. Secondly, I expect generally careful and relatively sound policies to emerge at the at the central level over time to accomplish the reform goals, but these are going to involve substantial time and work and are not simply decided by Xi Jinping. Don't mistake the big announcements for actual policies. Third, to, remeasure, to measure reform effectiveness, I think we have to continue to devote very considerable attention on, to such things as the evolution of operational incentives for key leaders at each of the territorial units at the four levels of government below the center, because those will drive the behavior of people who have enormous impact uh, within the territories that they uh, are responsible for. Uh, and at this point, and this is uh, based more on interviewing than anything else, my sense is these operational incentives are very far from having been worked out. Uh, it, they, it's just what the balance is, how you measure it, what the criteria are. It's, a, it's just, it's not easy to be a local territorial leader in China now and know what you need to be doing uh, and what the uh, trade-offs are, uh, given that no one can accomplish everything. Uh, so uh, one final comment, uh, which is that inevitably, frankly, the reforms uh, the aspirations of the reforms are extremely wide-ranging. That's a good thing. They need to be. These are ambitious objectives that are really important for the system. Uh, but inevitably, things aren't going to go as planned. And I suspect that at the end of the day, as with Deng Xiaoping's era, uh, one of the key uh, determinants of the success of Xi during the course of his entire tenure, it's going to be not only whether he's consolidated power and whether he's pushing reforms, but how effectively he manages the many things that will go wrong and manages to keep a political momentum behind the broad thrust of the reforms as he has to make tactical adjustments, pull back, find opportunities to move forward and to resolve a lot of things that simply are difficult to manage in a complex country undergoing major change. Let me stop there. Thank you. Since I'm mic'd up already, uh, let me take advantage of this to thank all three speakers uh, who have really uh, raised a, a very, very wide range of issues and suggest to me to some extent, without trying to uh, force these uh, generalizations, uh, some not necessarily big differences of opinion, but a different focus that each of them have uh, in looking at where China is today, uh, what the major issues might be. Uh, and, the, and the means by which uh, conflict and conflicting interests can or cannot be resolved. Um, I'm also struck overall by what in political science we of course call the level of, level of analysis question. Uh, uh, that uh, there may always be an intense focus on what's going on in Beijing and uh, several of the other uh, major cities, uh, but uh, on the other hand, as Ken has reminded us, 
this is a very big, very complicated, multi-layered system. Uh, and a lot of the real action uh, may not be in the Capitol. Uh, I'm almost reminded of the old um, uh, Steinberg New Yorker cover of the map of the world that looks at the world from, from New York and maybe to a bit of the near suburbs, but the rest of the world seems very, very distant. Uh, and uh, maybe there's an interesting way to look at this in the context of developments in China. Um, without in any way trying to uh, intrude on the kinds of questions, uh, I, what I took from these presentations uh, raises some, some questions that I hope uh, the panelists uh, can, can address. Um, the first is whether the problems and challenges that China confronts, particularly at a time of transition in its overall economic strategies, is qualitatively different from the problems that have been faced in the past? And if so, what are those differences? Um, related to this, of course, is the question of how deep are the stresses and contradictions within the system? Um, uh, we have a tendency sometimes, I think, in our analysis to look at the era we're looking at and to assume, assume that things are that much more uh, intense and difficult. But um, uh, all of us have been at this for a while. We've seen other periods of of uh, political stress in China, it would be important, I think, to highlight whether and how the present uh, is, is significantly, is significantly uh, different. Um, at the same time, the question of how conflicts are resolved or managed, uh, is there a transition here in how this is undertaken uh, that we need to understand as we analyze uh, China's present and future? Um, the other, the last point I would want to make, and then we'll, we'll open this up, um, is uh, how the consequences, reverberations of the actions that are taken, things that cannot necessarily be foreseen. Uh, all, of the, all of the panelists, I think, had a slightly to be determined quality to China's future, and I think that's appropriate. Um, it highlights to me, and I'm, I suspect to most of us, uh, just how complicated and in some ways uncertain China's future evolution may be. In any event, uh, I don't want to take more time than that. I want to compliment all of them. Uh, if anyone wants to react perhaps to some of the issues here I pose, but sooner, as soon as possible, we would like to open this up to questions from the audience. So um, I'll just make a quick comment on one of your questions, which is to say uh, how different uh, are the current types of issues from issues in the past? Because let's face it, in the past, at any time, any of us has been able to list a daunting array of challenges uh, that the leadership confronts. And they have, generally speaking, sur surprised on the upside in the sense of their pragmatism and capacity uh, to manage the challenges and basically move, move the agenda forward. I think the biggest change now is that crucial to future success is the capacity to become uh, more effective in terms of quality and innovation. Uh, and, and the question, I don't know the answer to it. My instinct is kind of similar to what we heard on the first panel, but I'm not fully sure of the answer, uh, is that this will require greater uh, openness uh, in the economy, but also intellectually, in expression. Uh, the leadership rightly is reaching out for more input from society, but it is creating very strong negative incentives for social activism. Uh, and so, for example, you take one of their biggest single problems, which is environmental. Uh, and I'm not aware of any major country that has cleaned up its environment without a powerful non-governmental green movement uh, as part of the mix, because the government is inevitably dominated by, you know, the the industries and and uh, you know resources, you know, resource companies uh, that have been there all along. So it's you know it's it's that element that gives me the greatest pause going forward. 
On Please. the same point, I share uh, Kim's views that perhaps there hasn't been a dramatic increase in the variety of problems that the leadership's facing. Uh, most of the problems were all already there, let's say 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, but the, um, the magnitude of each of the questions, each of the, the problems have increased so much, like um, abuse of power, for example. You know, uh, power corrupts, an absolute power, power corrupts, absolutely. Uh, we see that being unfold, unfolded in, in China and the, all the issues that I can just mention. Uh, they had all, always been there. Um, and now perhaps a new question would be the, the slowdown of economic growth, if that's coming. Uh, that's a very big new challenge. And how the fiscal situation will change or not uh, because of that, I think that's going to be the crucial issue. Um, if, if I could uh, push you a little on this, Professor Takahara, I think uh, you placed great emphasis in your presentation on right-left distinctions. Uh, and of course, that's a, that's a classic theme as we have looked, as we have looked at China. Uh, but um, would you see in, what would you see as the, as the links here between some of these, the intensity of these problems and, the, and, and how China evolves or if it can evolve towards a, a stable set of outcomes in terms of policy and how to implement policy? I would say the uh, difference in class, um, the income distribution mm -hmm. is so skewed now um, that the left has a very solid um, base uh, of their voice, as it were. There are a lot of the um, poorer side of the population that would support yes. uh, their ideas in criticizing marketization. Um, which we don't see very often if we live in big cities like in mm -hmm. uh, Beijing or Shanghai. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact is that Xi Jinping is rather tolerant uh, about the expression of these leftist I I ideas compared to uh, his predecessors. Um, why is he? Because, is it because of his inclination or is it because he finds uh, a balancing force necessary to counter uh, the, the rise of the, the right side on, on the other side. Uh, I am not exactly sure. Uh, but what I see now is the development of both sides, both the left and the right. And this uh, kind of a tug of war is becoming in, uh, more in, intense, uh, I, would, I would say, uh, year by year. Uh, I think uh, Professor yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So how can I say? So Xi Jinping, he is facing an old new problem, new old problem because so it's uh, how correct the information because in ten years, twenty years, China China's society has been dramatically changed. Mm -hmm. So every social group, the dreams and goals are quite a difference. Mm -hmm. So Xi Jinping government, how to correct, how how to organize, how to. Yeah, that is uh, the yeah. uh, program, yeah. I was going to say, so it's not a China dream, it's China dreams. Uh, it's yeah, yeah, more yeah. than one. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, thank you to, for all of the, uh, the, uh, the presenters for those additional comments. The floor is open. Please, number one, identify yourself. And number two, uh, be as concise as you can in the interest. I see somebody waving a two. Oh, yes, right there. Uh, it, I, I even know who it is. That's not why I'm recognizing, but that's Tony Kane. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Don Kirk. I'm a journalist. I spent a lot of time in Korea. Uh, well, I was. At, this, uh, go ahead. We'll I'm sorry. Am, am, am I? But no, no, that's all right. I was pointing in your general direction, but there okay. was someone ahead of you. That's well, okay. let me Don't just, I just uh, keep the question brief. Just identify yourself uh, again. Don Kirk. I'm, I'm a journalist. Uh, this, all the emphasis is on internal domestic policy, it seems. I'm just wondering whether uh, the presenters could uh, discuss the conflicts and, uh, and uh, differences that may be going on inside the leadership regarding policy toward uh, North Korea, for instance, uh, and possibly Japan as well. In other words, Northeast Asia. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I could just interject, uh, there will be a round two of this dialogue scheduled for sometime in February, late February, that will be specific. So I'm not in any way slighting those issues, uh, but we will try. I mean, if there's time to address them, fine. 
but I would think that for now we should really try to examine some of the uh, some of the questions raised uh, by by the panelists, if we could. So not. North Korea is so timely now in of view it is. of the and Sony so many, issue yes, and all that. Yeah, I understand. And we'll see. If there's time, we'll come back to it. Uh, Tony Kane was... Uh, well, I'm not sure if you're not going to have the same problem with my question. <laughs> uh, Tony Kane from American Councils for International Education. I, I was missing some of the input um, from another country, Russia. And from the standpoint of, I, uh, it seems to me that what Xi Jinping is facing is is not just issues of what how to do things differently, but you know how what other models to look for. And I certainly think that he seems to admire a lot of what Putin is doing. And like your sign in the village about you know the Westernizers getting out of China, I certainly think that you know what Putin is doing is doing that in Russia. And I see kind of Xi Jinping admiring that you know, different approach to trying to solve some of these problems from what his predecessors have done. And I just wondered if any of the panelists would care to comment on that. I, I think that this is much closer to this not being a foreign policy issue, and I'm not sliding the first question, but I think it is appropriate to, uh, to do any of you think that Xi Jinping is looking to Russia for, shall I say, inspiration or example? Uh, well, uh, she, from the very start, had building a strong relationship with Putin and a warm relationship with Russia as a top priority. Uh, he went to Moscow first uh, as he traveled abroad, and uh, uh, that was not by accident. Uh, I think he, in part, has been uh, uh, hoping to have uh, uh, successful examples of authoritarian political systems, and Russia fundamentally remains authoritarian, uh, that succeed in the modern world. And uh, Russia's uh, degree of success, at least initially, was something to be uh, pleased about, number one. Number two, uh, he's a strong, she is a strong, believes in a strong leadership model, clearly, very bold leader. And uh, I think when left on his own has been uh, very tough on tactical issues in foreign policy. Uh, we've seen him shift a little bit very recently, but fundamentally very tough on tactical issues. And I think, frankly, he admired uh, Putin's decisiveness. Uh, the question is, in part, what lessons is he taking from Putin's predicament now? Mm -hmm. And uh, those predicaments are very severe. One lesson he's taking, I think, is it's a good time to do energy deals with Russia, not to help Russia, but to lock in cheap energy while Russia is at a severe disadvantage. What broader lessons there are, we'll have to see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, we, we should also note, obviously, that, uh, that Putin may give, uh, he may be a teacher by negative example to the kinds of things that China wishes to avoid, but Professor Takahara? Uh, I think there's an interaction. It's not only uh, the Chinese learning from the Russians, but the Russians learning from the Chinese. Ah. I, I remember uh, reading in the Chinese press um, several years ago when, the, uh, when Putin's party and the CCP began this regular exchange, uh, once a year kind of a thing. And the Russian delegates uh, praising the China model, uh, <laughs> saying that there is a very good linkage between the legislature the executive and the judiciary. This is fantastic. That's what the Russians were saying. <laughs> uh, yes, right there. Yes. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online NewsHour. How far can Xi push the anti-corruption campaign without totally upsetting the apple cart? He's already gone past the taboo of going after a member of, a former member of the uh, standing committee. And in, v in view of what the professor said about, on the one hand, he's got to deal with the popular discontent, but to Ken's point, what better incentive is there for local leaders than to get obscenely rich, as they've been doing in the last decade or so. What kind of incentive do you replace uh, that with? That's a very difficult uh, question, because um, uh, I hear from my Chinese friends that uh, many young, capable uh, civil servants are now leaving their posts, uh, because they cannot see how uh, they can increase their in income uh, without corruption. <laughs> 
and, and compared with the uh, salaries that their former classmates are getting in these private enterprises and the big SSOEs, it just doesn't make sense for them. Uh, so I suppose uh, one question that Xi Jinping has to think very hard is how to maintain the uh, in in incentives of these uh, capable young leaders in government. One element that I have, or, or a major element that I haven't seen taken up seriously yet in China is the uh, need to very substantially increase compensation for civil servants uh, so that you turn the, uh, you know, the assumption that you can leverage your position for all kinds of benefits for your family and so forth uh, to more what Singapore has done or Hong Kong has done where you recruit top talent and retain top talent by paying them what they would have made had they been in the private sector. But I haven't seen that uh, uh, come close to a reality in China yet. So I agree they're in a very difficult uh, uh, period when they can't, where they'll have much more trouble retaining top talent. In increasing the salaries is an obvious measure to take, but then you have to think about the poor you know, what would the poor uh, side of the population be thinking when they see these uh, formerly corrupt officials now getting a salary uh, hike? <laughs> well, uh, good. yes. Uh, yes, I saw here, and Nixon, then over here. Uh, I'm Donald Barnes from South China University of Technology in Guangzhou. Uh, if, if you, if the panelists, uh, if each of you were Xi Jinping, well, <clears throat> What would be keeping you awake at night? Mm. <laughs> Good question. This panel. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he may be all right for the rest of his term if he's going to leave in 2022. Um, but, you know, there could, anything could happen. Uh, tomorrow. That's the view of some people in China, as, as you know. Um, but other people would say that they are um, things m very bad could happen if there was some natural disaster, like a big earthquake uh, or some epidemics. Uh, so are they, uh, is the leadership ready for those contingencies? I think it's a very um, immediate question that they have in their minds. So how can I say, um, according to um, the study on the authoritarian regime, so dictatorship, they are facing two problems. One is the how to share the power with, the, with elites. And the other problem is how to control mass people. So Xi Jinping also, they have paid attention to problem, so how to Commitment with the the their uh, in for for example um Politburo, uh, Politburo standing committee member. Uh, so my, my 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 answer is is that. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. To identify yourself, please. Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation. And uh, I just wonder, as the war turned, and you see Arab Spring, and you see people are unsatisfied in America, in the world. So I just wonder, is there any scholars or any revitalization of Confucius theories? You know, they don't just say GDP is good, because GDP is measure of a lot of these services. So if you think that Xi Jinping is about anti-corruption, is it just a rhetoric, or is it really to do something good for the well-being of the general public, for the people, Chinese people? Uh, oh, go ahead. Please. Uh, the, as, as a member of the Hong Ardai, the Red Second Generation, uh, I do think that he um, does have this determination to make things better for the people and society. But at the same time, he has to uh, win in the power struggle. And up to now, the only people that he has uh, persecuted in the 
anti-corruption drive is, uh, are, are people from the other side of the power struggle. Uh, so people are beginning to raise questions about his sin sincerity. Uh, that's point number one. But point number two, uh, he likes, uh, Mr. Xi likes Confucius very much. Uh, he, he went to this um, uh, academic meeting of uh, the scholars who do research into Con Confucianism, who gathered from uh, all over the world, and he gave a speech uh, clearly saying that he is for or the revival of Confucianism as, as it relates to the revival of ethics in society and so on and so forth. But I know, we all know that inside the party there are people who are against that I idea. And that is also one of the debates that they've been having. Uh, what to do with Confucius? Uh, do we keep the statue of Confucius uh, outside the, the museum or shall we take him inside? Um, so I. Uh, I think this question is going to remain for some time. People will keep on discussing what to do with Confucius, what are the ways to restore the ethical system in society. It's not an easy let, question. Let me, let me maybe pose this question, in, 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 if you will, in, a, in a, the way we often do it in, in democratic societies. If we were to look at Xi Jinping's approval rating, would you want to guess what that level is at and how sustainable <laughs> it is? Uh, depends upon who's asking the question. <laughs> uh, ser seriously, I, I, I'd like to go back to the question that, that sure. Akio was just addressing because I think it's ac actually critically important. I think the, uh, in China, when, if you want to have a really interesting discussion, you just raise one question and then sit back and watch Chinese discuss it, and that's the question of social ethics. And, uh, you know, this is a country that uh, has always been governed with a strong conscious uh, value attached to social ethics. Uh, social ethics being Confucianism or Mao's own thought. You know, Mao had a very strong sense of social ethics, differed from Confucianism, but still where the government uh, develops, exemplifies, and proselytizes a set of ethics for society. I think one of the biggest crises China now faces is a prolonged uh, absence of an agreed upon set of social ethics. And a common perception in society that sure, friends are good friends, but when it comes to broader social ethics, uh, the breakdown is very severe. Uh, and uh, they talk about that even at a high le leadership level, but I have seen extremely little done that would actually uh, move this along in, in a, uh, toward a set of goals that, that people understand and with a set of means that actually would contribute a lot to that. Uh, and I think it is probably one of the biggest concerns that they have, and rightly so. Uh, I'm not uh, trying to fit uh, uh, Chinese politics in a, in a democratic template. Uh, or a Western template, but I, I would almost want to think, I mean, given, I, mean, I agree with you that this is a fundamental issue that Chinese may feel, but I, I wonder whether she, as he thinks about his long tenure in office, assuming his health remains good, does he have a second term agenda, if you will, uh, that he thinks might be more practicable? In other words, if he's tackling something like corruption now, hoping that he can demonstrate that you can go after it, at least to some extent, and that, the, but because if it's almost like it would be a legacy issue. I mean, I, I hate to put it in in in, in Western terms, but uh, you know, he must be asking him. We asked what was maybe why he doesn't sleep well at night. If he if he doesn't sleep well at night, does he is he a politician with the kind of imag imagination, vision, if you will, uh, that could think about these kinds of questions and maybe articulate them at a subsequent point uh, in his in his leadership. Uh, pure speculation, but I think a lot of the questions we're asking here is are ones of how not only how capable is this man, but how how discerning, how much does he comprehend that these issues weigh very very heavily on how Chinese citizens look at their own society and look at look at their country's future. It's in other words, it's more than just simply the amassing of material wealth. It 
is there is there something different as well that needs to be achieved if he will achieve genuine legitimacy? I suppose that question uh, will depend on what Tomoki mentioned. That is, what sort of information is he really getting? Yeah. Is he really getting information about the truth of what the people feel about society? Mm -hmm. uh, like the Institute of uh, Sociology's research results, uh, are they reaching Xi Jinping? Mm -hmm. If they are reaching him, then uh, most likely he will think along those lines. Uh, what the people are really wanting is first e equality. Uh, then why isn't he doing more on uh, taxation reforms, for example? Um, well, he's trying to improve on social welfare, uh, that we, we can see, but I, I suppose there is more that he can do. Now, on, only recently, he's ordered this uh, reduction in the salaries of the top level uh, leaders in the uh, SOEs. Yes. Uh, that's, that's one measure, but is it only that? I mean, that's, not, that's not a systemic <laughs> change. But even there, you, you see the kind of contradiction that he confronts almost everywhere. Uh, you know, the, the top leaders of the national oil companies have just taken tremendous salary reductions. Uh, and uh, that reflects domestic complaints. You know, these, these top leaders of the Knox uh, have the rank of vice minister. And uh, vice governors of provinces have been complaining they have the same rank as the vice, you know, as someone who heads an oil company and the person who heads the oil company, uh, you know, is making 10 times their income legitimately, right, on the salary scale. But that person who heads the oil company didn't get the job because a search committee had a global search and hired the person who had the best performance record. It's a party decision. Right? And many of them seek eventually, having made their money and everything, to become government officials in a province or at a central ministry. You know, it's an integrated system. So you have a matter of equity, but then the heads of the oil companies say essentially, look, when I sit down at Davos, uh, I'm talking with people who are making 10 times what I'm making. You know, <laughs> if you limit me to making whatever, $100,000 equivalent a year, uh, I'm not in the conversation. And so how do you get, how do you reconcile a system where the, you know, the top positions in the major economic units are still party positions, the incumbents decided, you know, chosen by the organization system, the, the, you know, the Zujibu of, of the party, uh, and yet you're dealing in a global economic environment. How do you reconcile these contradictions? And those kinds of contradictions are everywhere. So it's very, uh, there's a lot salary, that you can see up at night. Under, under socialism, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I see a hand way in the back. Oh, I'm Dennis Halpin from the U.S. Korea Institute at SAIS. I had a question about uh, Hong Kong and what's been going on. I wonder what the scorecard was because in one sense it, it looked like Xi Jinping waited out the students and the people in Hong Kong got tired. The students went away, but they said they'll be back. And the other curious thing was him choosing this fall to bring up one country, two systems as a model for Taiwan, a core interest, just at the same time that all this unrest was taking place in Hong Kong. So how does Hong Kong and what happened there play into Xi's leadership skills and uh, the evaluation of him by the uh, other leaders in Beijing. Good. Anyone want to have a crack at that? Um, I tend to see the uh, Hong Kong demonstrations um, along the line that started by the sunflower movement in Taiwan. Uh, the issues were similar in a way, I mean, in the sense that uh, they were both um, initiated and implemented by young people, particularly those in universities, uh, who are having this frustration that uh, because of the money um, and people that come from the mainland, uh, they think that the real estate prices have gone, gone up, there's so little hope to buy houses, uh, particularly for the young people, and they're generally frustrated about uh, this 
um, income inflow of uh, mainland people, mainland money, um, and and what have you. Uh, so I suppose uh, Xi Jinping must have been very worried that this will come also to mainland China because similar issues are there uh, in the mainland. And in that sense, uh, he must be uh, praised by other members of the leadership that he handled it very well. Uh, and he succeeded in his uh, propaganda uh, campaign, uh, which began at a certain point of time, uh, well time, um, and convinced the Chinese people that this was not a good thing for Hong Kong and this is not a good thing for or mainland China uh, also. Uh, other questions? If not, we will turn to the first question, at least as a preview of coming attractions. I mean, questions related to China's regional strategies, uh, questions of North Korea uh, are very, very big ones. But do you want to uh, pose your question again, sir, uh, just so that the, to refresh the audience's uh, Yes. Thank you. I, I didn't think I was going to have a second chance at this. You know, uh, sometimes you get second chances. <laughs> well, I was just wondering, <clears throat> you know, about divisions and differences of opinion and viewpoint and emphasis when it comes to um, policy toward North Korea, which is obviously very difficult for China, and, you know, Japan as well. Uh, but I was particularly interested in North Korea since, uh, you know, it's so much in the news. Uh, this very week. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, the, uh, uh, I think there is widespread agreement uh, at the top in China. By the way, Jonathan is the North Korea expert here, so he's going to wrap up with his uh, a gloss on this. Uh, but I think there's widespread agreement that the North Korean regime is, uh, uh, is uh, not helpful uh, either to the people of North Korea or to China uh, at this point. And they have undertaken, the Chinese have taken all, undertaken all kinds of uh, measures to demonstrate their chagrin with North Korea. Uh, I think if we see a fourth nuclear test in North Korea, we will see China become even tougher. Uh, having said that, I think the debates in China are over fine. These guys are terrible in the North. Uh, they're a pile of trouble for us. They are not moving in directions that are helpful. Uh, but then tactically, what do you do about it? You know, how do you best manage that? And I think there, I, I hear a lot of different views in China, but they are, I don't hear anyone in China saying we are like lips and teeth with North Korea. Uh, and these folks are, are people that we uh, you know, share weal and woe with. Uh, those days are long gone. Uh, it's kind of a problem of what do you do with a system where you fear its collapse and the consequences that that could have. You fear its success in terms of development of operational nuclear capability. Uh, and these are very tough folks who, when you push them, tend to push back harder rather than giving in. And so how do you manage that? And it kind of resonates to me with somewhat of the kinds of debates we've had over policy toward Cuba over the years and a lot of, you know, a lot of other things. Not clear where to come out. Uh, Akio, okay, have you been able to uh, interact with uh, Chinese scholars and others during your time in Beijing? Do you, get, do you get a sense of how this issue resonates or does not? Um, I think the case of North Korea and the case of Japan could be a little different. Yes. Because in mm -hmm. the case oh, of... Yeah. Uh, North Korea, yes, uh, it seems quite clear that Xi Jinping himself does not like the North Korean leader very much. And, uh, you know, that's the, that sort of defines the basic line, as it were, uh, in the attitude that the Chinese have been taking towards North Korea. However, uh, over the issue of whether North Korea should remain as North Korea as a buffer uh, in geopolitical terms, um, the importance of North Korea as a buffer, uh, uh, you know, there's a debate over that. And about Japan, um, you know, the leaders' meeting that happened on the 10th of November uh, was very good. I can talk a lot about that. But anyway, um, it's, it was supposed to be a big signal uh, to the Chinese people that 
the faces change, that now it's not confrontation or tussle, but rather cooperation. Um, however, looking at the Chinese media after the, the meeting, um, I, I, I can see that there is opposition within the, the, the Chinese um, uh, leadership, as it were. Um, particularly um, coming from the military people, we hear voices uh, criticizing Japan for this and that. Um, so I can sense that there is a voice that you know, is trying to argue otherwise, that it's not time yet, at, at least. It's not, time has not come yet to make compromises with Japan or ameliorate uh, the relationship. So, so can I ask the question about the Hong Kong issue? So oh, because, sure. Because yeah, yeah, sure. it's a right. little bit difficult for, to answer for me. Okay. I'm sorry. So I, so I want to ask the Hong Kong issue. So, so for Xi Jinping point of view, it's a big challenge because the Hong Kong citizens to show that how to use social media, how to do so demonstration. So if the Chinese citizens learn from the Hong Kong mm -hmm. issue, so it's 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 big challenge for, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Xi Jinping. Very 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 good very good. Um, uh, if I could just, I'll make a couple of comments about China and North Korea, and then uh, since we don't want uh, to deny people the opportunity to get some, get some lunch, although I think this has been an excellent, excellent panel. Um, there's no question but that uh, the, the center of gravity uh, in deliberations about North Korea has shifted, part of it the instigation of Xi Jinping, uh, but partly uh, reflecting China's own, shall we say, disappointment uh, with the North. This is a long-running story. It's not of recent vintage, uh, but there have been successive events that have not validated the underlying assumptions that China has tried to make about uh, how you could imagine some kind of a, of a policy transition in the North. Rather, uh, even as North Korea is a much more, um, I don't call it freewheeling, but, but you know, there's, a, there's a lot of economic activity there. There are a lot of North Koreans who are getting wealthy. Um, but if I look at least as, as shattering to Chinese thinking as their continued nuclear tests was the execution of Chang Sung Tech, uh, uh, young Mr. Kim's uncle, uh, who was the primary interlocutor for the leadership of China uh, on economic matters with North Korea, uh, someone who was well-traveled in the world, and uh, therefore the question of whether or not you even have a means by which you could reach leaders in Pyongyang is an open question. But there's no question in my mind that the progressive alienation and distancing of, of China from North Korea, even if you know, no one is in effect saying we're just going to write them off. You still are searching for some kind of a way that you could have a quasi-normal relationship. All of this at a time that the relationship with the Republic of Korea continues to advance. I mean, Park Yun-hye, the president of the ROK, has now met with Xi Jinping, I believe, on five separate occasions. Uh, there's a sense in which they have not only a personal chemistry with one another, but more to the point, uh, if China's leaders look at where their equities lie on the peninsula, uh, their relationship with South Korea, the, uh, the, uh, the tra the tra China now does almost as much trade with South Korea as it does with Japan. The numbers are really very close. That's an extraordinary figure if you, if you think about it, the fact that Japan is a much bigger economy. Um, the levels of interaction, there are now 70,000 Korean students in China, and there are 70,000 Chinese students in Korea. So the question we're really asking is that if, if leaders in Beijing ask themselves, let's look at the two Koreas and see where our interests lie, I think we can see what the answer is. That said, there may be some genuine concern or worry about the possibility longer term of, uh, of an erosion or major upheaval within the North, although that hasn't been manifested yet. But in, in my own view, I think the tone of, of how Chinese, even prominent Chinese, not just scholars, but others 
who have had major involvement on these issues continues to change. The question is whether or not future actions that North Korea might undertake uh, would, would trigger a larger uh, reassessment on the part of Xi and others. And on that, we will, have to, we will have to wait and see. It is interesting, by the way, as I anticipated, uh, if young Mr. Kim uh, is to travel abroad, uh, his first trip abroad, uh, I had anticipated, would not be to China, but would be to Russia. And the Russians have now extended an invitation to him to travel uh, to Russia in May uh, for the celebration of the victory over Germany. Um, whether he goes or not remains to be seen. But uh, as I would see it, it's a kind of it's almost like this is an, this issue is a microcosm, microcosm for China, recognizing that the implications of this, depending on which way developments go inside the North, will have a huge triggering effect uh, on China. Uh, and the Chinese are trying to find ways to limit the risks, limit the assistance, uh, but not in a way that at least yet calls into question the, the existence of North Korea, if you will. China's not at that point, but, uh, but certainly the changes in deliberation and debate have really been quite striking over the last few years, and I suspect that that is going to continue. Uh, the, the, I mean, on that, the Chinese have made clear as recently as yesterday, as have the Russians, that uh, they, they, their argument is, is that um, uh, human rights do not belong in deliberations in the UN Security Council. Uh, you know, so we're going to see them go through the motions. I don't know that the, you know, again, the North Koreans obviously don't like to be shamed, uh, although they're kind of shameless in a lot of their own behavior. Uh, but um, the Chinese and the Russians both see this as, as not appropriate at the ICC. Whether, whether it uh, materializes in a way, uh, I mean, realistically, Kim is not going to be dragged before the international court for human rights violations. But it does suggest how the tenor of international debate about North Korea, I think, quite apart from the nuclear issue, has undergone, I think, a significant transformation. And... Uh, uh, the Chinese and the Russians, even if they try to, to slow this discussion, uh, they, they can't ignore it, but they'll try to limit it. Uh, let, let us, uh, please, a round of applause for, for really an excellent panel.